marvelous. So what I was trying to show, thank you for everyone's patience, Zoom had a bit of a glitch, was that in this section, uh, I'm, this is my default on my open project on my own computer. If you're looking at projects on the cloud, you are in one, so you don't see anything necessarily different. But when you're on your own computer, you can navigate to the entirety of it often. And you can see where you are, where it's looking from this section here. So you can see I've got all sorts of things in this particular um, directory, and I actually don't want to be there. I want to be in here, the workshop, to see the workshop files and folders and things. Now, this is now different to this. So if I wanted to go back to where I was, I can then use that little arrow that points to the right to go back to my working directory. But if I want to set my working directory to be down here with where all my files are so that I can find where I'm working with the workshop material, not with my default, which could be your C drive, I need to tell it somehow how to know where to look. And that's where we use the project information. And the way we can sort of navigate, ooh, let me see if I can see it in here, is, sorry, in environment, I'm on the wrong bit here, I think. Um, oh, here, sorry, I'm wrong. But three dots here in the bottom right-hand quadrant where you've got the files, plots, packages, help and viewer, there are three dots to the far right. And if you click on that, it opens up a window which looks very familiar to File Explorer, but it's actually within our studio. So you can see the little icon in the top left hand corner. And this helps you navigate. So you can see all of my uh, mess on my computer. This is why I need projects because I can get quite uh, lost in my own C drive and network drives and things like this. So that can help you navigate to your particular folder. So I'm opening the folder, which actually, if I do conference, then you can see open. And down here, I'll say workshop and conference. So you can do quite a lot in this area as well. So you can move between folders, you can rename files, you can um, do copy and move. It's, it's quite flexible. It's very similar to our no, file explorer. It is our studio. And organization with the plots is incredibly important. Not all of these, what am I doing? Oh, I seem to have got stuck. Organization is really, really key. And you to try and make life easier for yourself, which is why I love projects so much because I am, you can see it's quite messy. You can get lots of files and things in one place and you don't know where you are. It's really useful as well for those who are in the NHS or um, other public sector organizations that use network drives that start like slash slash. When you're trying to get your files to be drawn from those kind of network drives, I found it really difficult to get the pathways right. But if I tell it, this is your project, and this is where you are. Is that still sharing the screen? Yeah, I still see. Oh, good. I just had something flash on my Zoom and uh, uh, I think it's a different screen. Don't worry, sorry, distracted. <clears throat> uh, where was I? So yes, I don't know what I was saying. It, cognitive load, I've clearly got a lot of cognitive load when I'm trying to explain the messiness of my file structure. So to create a project now on mine, actually, if you go to the top right hand part of your screen, if you're on the laptop, if you're on the cloud, just watch because this is something you might need, or you will need when you're on your own laptop, but it's very, very different concept on the cloud you get this short menu of what's in there. And as you can see, I've got all of these projects and things that I've been working with, and I can just flip between them really easily, backwards and forwards without having to navigate to the right folder. One might be over here, one might be over there, and I can just flip between them. But to create a new project, if you do new project dot, 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 you get a wizard. Oh yes, there's some other reasons on this slide actually. Switching between them is very important. That's what I was concentrating on. Organizing your workflow, that's very similar. And sharing scripts is incredibly important. Instead of saying set working directory, which is code for something that you might use like set working directory to your own, say if you've got an H drive or a U drive, which is just locked to you, others won't be able to see that. So they'll be trying to set their working directory to something that they don't have access to. Whereas if you share a project, it's kind of all self-contained. So I briefly went through that. I went to the shortcut, but this slide is showing how to go through the menus to get to this wizard. So file, new project, new directory, and then uh, it says new project again, which is not quite right. So new directory, oh yes, new project it is. 
and then I'm going to rename it. Now those on the cloud don't follow this because it, it won't actually work because you need to do something slightly different. And I don't want to go into the cloud today. It's already too, too much trouble with a uh, Zoom. So I've, I'm going to call it work. I'm going to call it workshop ship workshop R without the hyphen because I think I've already got one in there and I'm going to create a project. And it takes a bit of time, certainly doesn't my computer because it doesn't like working in this kind of section where you've got lots of things running. And very little has changed, it looks like. I've lost all the files here because I was using a new project, not an existing project. You can set it in an existing file, but this is a new project within uh, some file structure here that I've got. And you can see where it is here. So this is the, the pathway along the top. But if I wanted to go back to the one I was in, which isn't actually there. If I open project, I'm going to go into workshop R. I'm going to open one I put, it's like one I made earlier. This is one I made earlier, it's very Blue Peter. For references for international people, this is a children's television program that's been going a number of years. So now I'm in my workshop R. This tells me I'm in workshop R. And if I look at my files, I can see all the files that are related to the workshop. I think the key point for me, and I'm kind of like moving around the screen, which could be quite tricky. So if anybody has uh, kind of got stuck and thought, where were you? Please do say. But the key thing for me is always in the top right hand corner of my laptop. I have all the options related to projects and project options. I can create a new project. I can open them or I can have these shortcuts that I've previously opened. And uh, if you, the, the slides are quite self-explanatory, it's my talking around it that might confuse things. Uh, but if you followed those instructions, you should start your project. Now, if you've got your files already downloaded somewhere, I'll just do it briefly. If you do new project into the wizard, I should have done this actually the first time around, go to existing directory, and then you can find the directory that you're trying to put your project in. So you've already got something, your folder's already set up, you've got all your files there, and you want to make that into a project, you can do that as well very easily. And that's very useful as well. This bottom bit, don't worry about it. It's about version control. So that's related to GitHub or some other kind of version control things that you may be working with. So the reason why it's very, well, I mean, I've given various reasons, but the reason why it's quite useful to have your, quite useful, very useful to have your project in a place is that if you save something, that's where it puts it. If you export to your project, that's where it goes in that file, that folder, the same folder. And we'll see this on the cloud as we move along because the cloud is a project. Anything that you upload will come into that project. Anything that you export or save, that's where it will go. Any questions? Because I kind of like really, I know I really struggle to explain what life was like without projects. And uh, that's my failing because I've used it so long. It seems like a big leap to go, just go here, 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 here. Okay, no questions. So I think that's all right. But if it doesn't make sense at any other point, please do shout out. The next bit that we're going to do is about importing data. And we're going to specifically concentrate on CSV files in the first instance. But bear in mind that lots and lots of data files and information can be imported into R. It's incredibly flexible. If you're using something, there'll probably be a package out there to get those things in. What do users on the cloud do at the moment? OK, no, just for that bit about the projects, don't worry about that. Sorry, somebody just asked about the uh, projects. This is more about what you would use on your computer. Um, just to sort of highlight, this is a project already. So. Now you're on the cloud, we're gonna move on and uh, importing data is something that both setups will use. But what I never want to do is to exclude people from the cloud because it's already there because you will use it when you move to your own computer, hopefully. Importing data, as I said, you can use many, many different um, project uh, pro programs are out there and getting that data into your R Studio. There'll be something that's available either through R Studio or somebody has created a package for it. And we're going to use the commonly used ones, CSV files or Excel, but we're going to use CSV today. And we're going to, and I hope you can see this, depending on where you are, in whether you're using your laptop or cloud, this file here, nope, nope, this one here. Oh, resume. Called capacity underscore AE.csv. I seem to have lost my connection. It's coming back. So as I've said pre previously, as in um, Microsoft, there are multiple ways of getting your 
of doing anything. So there are multiple ways of getting your data into your uh, area that you're working in, your project, hopefully if you're working in a project. The first one is up here with a drop down menu which says import data set. And if you click on that, it gives you a short menu of um, text from base, text from Redar, Excel, SPSS, SAS and Stata. And I will just move that on. And what we're going to use is from text read R dot 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 today to get that capacity underscore a dot CSV file into our studio. If you click on that, you get this wizard that pops up, as you can see here, you can see it twice. And it's not showing anything because it's not pointing to anything. You've just opened a wizard to say, import this data set. It might be quite familiar or similar to things in Excel. I'm not entirely sure. But I think the concept is similar that you need to browse to the file that you're looking for. It doesn't have to be in your project. It could be anywhere within your computer or if you're on the cloud, this is what you should see. Everything that's already loaded into that project. And what we're going to be uploading is capacity. Well, it's already uploaded, sorry importing into this particular section. Okay, somebody got lost, so I will go again. If I just open this up bigger, on the screen, I'm looking at import data set here, which is in the environment in the top right-hand corner of the quadrants. Get rid of that. So import data set, you get a short menu, and then from text, read R dot, 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 and it opens a blank wizard. And then you need to browse to find the file to import to, for this session to work with the scripts. I say import because it's kind of like, I can't think of the other word. You're importing it into this particular R Studio session. And I'm looking for R for capacity underscore AE dot CSV and then open. Is everybody okay with that? So you can see the, the, the now the wizard has changed. You'll have tech your code here not code but this is your data on the left and you've got some script now down in the bottom right hand corner so we located the file using browse which uh is here still i made it big so it's there and then you can look at your data and see if it's the right data you can't find the file amanda are you on the cloud or you're probably on your pc i think i'm guessing it's a pure guess cloud oh do you want to share your oh <laughs> i'm a bit worried about sharing screens that it might lose um uh so do you see in your bottom right hand corner all of these files at all i'm suspecting you might have it all blank here you do see them excellent so when you go to import data set and then text read r you should get this wizard which has got nothing in it what was the name if you browse it is called capacity underscore ae dot csv you can double click on it when you're in that section and then um, hopefully open yay well done well done so this is a great opportunity when you're update uh, uh, loading your data not uploading loading it does it look right have you got the right formats is it the right structure do you understand it even what is in it uh, we can import it says not what we want and it's kind of in capitals and it sounds like don't do it but you can do this uh import oh somebody else can't get their file i'm on the browser so ian you're on the cloud and you have all the files in the bottom right hand corner so you can see the screen like this where you've got all of this stuff gubbins down in the bottom right is that what you see i don't see any of those files okay um oh i feel like i'm gonna have to do a share screen um what Okay, so we can use this import. There's no reason not to. It's just that what we want to show, what I want to show you in this course is that you can just copy lines of this code. You don't have to take it all. Now, if you do want to take it, if you didn't want to just import, 
you can copy the code by using the notepad at the uh, top of this scripted area, or you can copy sections of this. Now for this, I'm going to take, I've already loaded tidyverse and read R is in there. The view just opens it so that you can see the code, the data, sorry, not the code. I'm just going to copy this middle line and I'm just going to do control C because that's how I use it and I'm going to do cancel. So whichever way you do it, don't worry, uh, we can catch up with that. But what we're trying to do is just take one line of code for the script. Um, so if I just sort of reinforce, if you copy from the clipboard, which is that little notepad, you get the three lines, which is load this package, import this data file, and then view it. Or if you just take one line, which is what I've done, because we were already using Redar because it was loaded as in Tidyverse, just take that one line. Very flexible and kind of too flexible in some regards that you can do lots of different things with it. I'm now going to run it and I use Control Enter to run things because it's a keyboard shortcut, just to remind you there's the run key as well. Somewhere on that line, doesn't have to be highlighted, I just had my cursor in there. And then you can see something's changed here in the environment. You've now got this new thing that's appeared, <coughs> which says capacity underscore A. Is everybody okay with that and has got that far? Wonderful. Well, I've come to the end, but I can go through that. And we will do this a couple of times with different files to reinforce importing data. Guys, got a cough. Right, and the next section we're going to cover is an introduction to ggplot2. Now, it, it does sort of fall in the strange way. You normally sort your data out and then you plot it, but it would be nice to just see your data plotted first of all. Oh, Janet, there's a couple of issues in the, in the chat. So you have an error saying could not find the function read underscore CSV. Have you run this line of code? I don't know if you're on your own. Are you on your PC? Let's start with that. And Bridget's is the same. Right, you're on the cloud. Okay, so I think what you might need to do, first of all, is to do this library tidyverse to load it and Bridget too, if you're in the cloud. <clears throat> you need to load all the packages. You'll get all of this kind of colorful stuff down here saying what's being loaded. And then if you import your data, you'll then see lots of stuff. I think that's the issue. I think to speed up things, rather than going through the wizard, what you can do is just click on the file itself. Oh, brilliant, Janet, that's great. But if you just, oh dear, somebody's having network issues. Oh, so the file's not downloaded, okay. If you, because I'm just going to say this quickly, so if people are struggling with going through, you know, getting it all set up and then going to import data set, it can be quite long winded. Just click on the file you want, import data set, and then it already knows what it is that you're trying to import. You don't have to navigate to it. You can already see it and that will give you that code and you can also see all the stuff that you need to do there. As I say, we'll go through that again. <laughs> Wonderful. You're all working now. Ggplot2. Um, on this slide, just to highlight the great artwork by Alison Horst, uh, she's a statistician, I think, who is the resident artist for R Studio. It's kind of promoting the fact that R and R Studio see the creativity in our coding as well as with other things like artwork. So these are little friendly creatures that sort of join us on our journey with learning. They go from that confounded one that we saw earlier where they're like, I'm really confused to being artistic here with masterpieces and ggplot2. So it's a nice little friendly way of explaining certain things. And she's explained statistical concepts using artwork, which I think is fabulous. Another acknowledgement here is for this course was based on the R for Data Science book, which um, particularly chapter three, it's all available online <clears throat> free. And in fact, what we're going to do, because I've decided I've never read it, I am doing a book club from it's a week on Friday, so I think it's the 12th, through our NHSR Slack group, we have a book club, and I would like to um, read R for data science, data science for anybody of any uh, level, because even when we have learned R, sometimes it's good to go through this, the concepts, as we should do, because I haven't done that, and I'd like to invite you all to it as well. So to continue in your learning, 
come and join us with the R for data science and read the book together because it will really help me get through the book too. Now, ggplot2 is not the only visualization tool within R. There are many other ways of doing it. You can actually plot it in what is known as base R, which is the, the kind of like the raw R that is underpinning quite a lot of packages. <clears throat> Public Health Scotland also use an interactive package called Plotly, which is a really powerful one. And Annie is going to be doing a workshop, if that's right, on Plotly later on in this week, which will be really interesting, I think, because um, it's a very powerful package. You yes. can create your ggplot2 and then wrap it, but she's going to do it like from the basics. So using Plotly as its own package. But this is the flexibility of them, that you can sort of um, combine packages together. So that's really useful. <clears throat> this is quite an old tweet, if I just make that bigger, sorry, so that everybody can see, saying people predominantly use mostly ggplot2. Why use it? It's very popular. It's well designed and supported through uh, our studio, along with other packages, which we find in Tidyverse. It's but highly versatile, as I said, it's been used in other packages or other packages are based on it or it contributes. It's very good. You can break into it in a sense and work with it. It's very attractive with little work. It says attractive with a little work, sorry, not, not with little work, with a little work. I've taken some Excel uh, charts that I've created and then coded them into uh, ggplot2. And I think that's what I'm, I'm actually doing is instead of doing clicking and dropping and selecting things, I'm coding the entire chart. So it can be a lot of code to reproduce what you can do quite simply in Excel. But what you can't do with Excel necessarily is reproduce that, say, 100 times just by pressing a button, which is what you can do when you use a scripted language. It doesn't have to be R either. It could be something else, but it's something that I particularly like. <clears throat> so a couple of links down here at the bottom of this slide you know, arguments for using ggplot and arguments against. So you'll get this a lot, but we're just going to introduce you to one thing and quite a lot of people use it. This is an example of the BBC. They use uh, ggplot2, they have a style guide and their code is available through their GitHub. This is a link in itself, this image, and then you can use some of their bits and pieces. So it's quite powerful. These were all produced in ggplot2. So you probably all now have tidyverse linked in uh, you know in the library running so in that tidyverse we've also got ggplot2 running let's explore a perennial challenge for the nhs i say this was written before the pandemic it's, it's more than perennial now isn't it we're talking about pressures in a and e demand and capacity oh dear yes that's a big topic and it has been for such a long time this is an old data set from 2017 to 2018 this is publicly available data through the NHS benchmarking network. <clears throat> you imported or loaded the capacity underscore AE, which is a data frame now, if I show you. Oh, there we go, try it that way around. So this is what it refers to when they're saying data frame, it appears here as an object and it is a data frame. Um, there's a lot of terminology that I'll be covering. So those who are familiar with SQL, you'll know this is a table. And I did this as well. I, I call data frames tables, but within data frames, there are things called, um, that's another slide, actually, I've moved it, tibble. So there's a lot of language <coughs> that becomes very familiar when you work sort of in the realms of R and R Studio or R stats if you're on Twitter, let's say. And this thing, this concept of tidy data, which is artwork again by Alison Horse, but inspired from Hadley Wickham's paper, is something that you will be familiar with when you work with relational data bases that other people like data warehouses. The concept was familiar to me, but I didn't know the terminology. And when we're talking about data, tidy data, the way I sort of view it is Excel spreadsheets, when we share, share them with people, they're human friendly readable often. You'll have one row per patient and each say ward or condition will have one column. So you can read along left to right as we do predominantly and just sort of like see it across human friendly that is not tidy data. So when we're in the relational database world of data warehouses, we see long data. So each um, category is a column. So the wards will be repeated, say. So if patient one was in ward A, they'll also then have a second line if they move to ward B and it will be repeated. It's not so easy to read as a human. It's machine friendly. 
and that's what tidy data is and these are kind of like the kind of formal concepts of variables and observations and cells that's how I view it so I suppose it's just long data so fewer columns but longer like you would have in a data book warehouse that's what we're aiming for Tibble is another <clears throat> name that's quite R specific it is a data frame but there are a few things that are available to it so I didn't really know the difference for a long time but I think when you view your data and it appears in the console which we will do when you're working with a tibble it shows you the top 10 if you're working with a data frame it shows it all and you have to scroll through that's like the main difference there's a bit more information in there if you wanted to know specifically about tibble but that's what I quite like it's about kind of creating tables but it's an R studio thing and I think tibble comes maybe Maybe not, I'm not sure from New Zealand way of speaking because Hadley Wickham is from New Zealand and I think they might, it might be because they say tibble rather than table, but I'm not sure. I might be making that bit up, but it's nice if it isn't, if it is. So we can see capacity underscore AE up here in the environment and we can click on it, which will both do the view capacity underscore AE, which was the code that we didn't copy from the wizard. So that's what happens. And now you can see it in the, um, uh, environment, not environment in the, oh, I forgot what it's called now, the top left hand corner. It doesn't have the name on that window. So you can see your, your data and you can view it and have a look. The other thing you can do to look at your data is to click on the blue triangle to the right and then you can see what the columns are, what they're actually made up of, whether they're numeric or logical and just a few of the bits of data that you can see there. That's quite useful to have a quick view. Uh, it comes up in a new tab. The other useful thing about our studio in particular is that there's this particular button here, which is between the filter and the arrow right. The arrow right will take you to the script and the arrow, sorry, arrow left will take you to the script. So you're moving between your tabs. But this particular one is a show in a new window. So if you're on your data tab and you click on that, it pops it out into its own screen. Uh, you might not get that if you're on the cloud and you've got pop-ups disabled. Oh, sorry, Shyam, I didn't see that bit. When you say show that again, which bit were you looking for? I don't know what I've missed. Sorry, the, the, the table on the top left, how did you get that to show? Oh, okay, yep. So I clicked on capacity underscore AE here in the top right I just clicked on it once and then it opens up and you also get code down here so that for any action you have in our studio I think that's fair to say there is code behind it so you can just run direct code or you can just click and, and like you would do in Microsoft for example is that okay so you've got that file now the tab let's say with the data I can also put that into the chat so that you can follow oops there we go and then to pop it out next to filter button you've got show in a new window and it pops it out which is really useful if you're on multiple screens and then you can look at your code next to your data as i said there is a function now in um, or functionality within uh, our studio that you can have three columns but i won't do that on the screen because it's really really small so that's another way of sort of seeing your data which is useful so you can see I can put that next to it and just code and look at it. Some more ways to run it actually is just to write capacity underscore AE and then run that. Just do control and enter. And then instead of you, you're viewing it, but you're viewing it within the console. So you see the top 10 because this is a tibble. So it says a tibble, 68 by 5. So the 68 are the rows and the 5 are the columns. And you can just see a bit more information in there. And we're going to do that repeatedly because it kind of throws it down into the console and it's a bit easier than moving and navigating around the screen. And the only, all you need to do is have your cursor either at the beginning, the end or somewhere in that and then run your code. And I've done it again and it just shows it doesn't doesn't clash with itself, for example. So first, first of all, we need to um, understand, see if we understand the variable names. <clears throat> so just to show briefly the site. Here we have, that's just a number, uh, like a unique number. 
the staff attendance, so that the attendance is probably people, individuals, staff increase, that's binary, yes or no, but in this context, it's true or false. And, uh, oh, you can't see it all on here because I haven't got it all, my screen's not big enough. There you go, you see D cubicles and D weight, and they're the differences in averages between 2017 and 2018 for the cubicles and for the weight. Just a brief overview of what, what the data refers to. Another nice image from Alison Horst showing, and I think this is something that I really did not do enough of when I was first doing, I mean, I've been an analyst for uh, a decade now. I would work on my data in SQL and shape it, as it were, and then move it to Excel and then do polished charts. So the polished bit means that I never just looked at my data as a chart just to see how it is, if I've got any data quality errors. And that is a really crucial thing to do. And I think that's why I quite like R and R Studio in that you can start with your data, tidy it up a bit and just have a quick look, just do something really quick. It's not polished, it's not the end result, but it's it just as meaningful to, have you cleaned everything? Have you spotted all the errors? And charts and graphs give us a lot of information about our data, a lot more than just tables of numbers. I think even Florence Nightingale liked tables and numbers, but she did a few visualizations which are classic in the uh, visualization world and are very meaningful both to, I think, statisticians and also to general public. So the question we want to answer here is a change in the number of cubicles available in AE associated with a change in length of attendance. It's quite a complicated question, but what we're going to do is look at it in a chart. So I'm going to explain the code as I write it. I'm just going to write it as well. So ggplot. And what I'm calling there, as you can see, it kind of comes up with all this bit of information about what this is. This is a function. So there's a lot of information that we can put into our function. And there are lots of reminders in our studio about what it is and did you mean this? Should we be typing this in? You can follow along um, doing the typing. And as I've typed everything, I'll then copy sections into the chat so that people can then run that if it hasn't quite worked for you when you've been typing along or you just want to pay attention to this and then run your code to see what it looks like. That's absolutely fine. At the end of this line in ggplot2, we do layers. And the point of the layers to say this continues, there's something else to go on, is that you put a plus sign at the end. You need to tell it the data set that you're running. So I'm just like we did before when we got the wizard, we just got the wizard. We didn't say what to open. You need to say we want to plot this, but what is it that you want to plot? We need data in there. So you can tell it data equals, and we're looking at capacity, and that's the data set. If I get rid of that plus, because that plus means look for something underneath, and I just run that, that is my plot. <coughs> because for those uh, eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that we haven't told it what exactly to plot. There's no X and there's no Y stipulated. I've just said, this is your data, which is quite big. And I haven't said also what type of chart to do. So the next line here is geom point. I'll just rush through this quickly because I think the next slides go into it in a bit more detail, uh, particularly when you're using words like AES what that means and y equals, not minus, equals d, y equals d weight. I'm gonna do it quickly. I'm gonna do control and enter to run it. And then I'll copy that into the code for everybody to see. So on that occasion, what we've done is we've chosen a point chart and we've told it what the x axis is and the X axis and the Y axis is. So I've given it a little bit more information about how to plot it and what it is that we're doing. So this is about the choice because uh, the only real choice that we've made here is what type of chart to use. And there are various within uh, ggplot. So if I just write ggplot, ooh, good help if I spell. Uh, data equals capacity. A, and then do a plus for that bit and then do G on. You get all of these options that you can choose and there's so many in there. One of them I don't think you have thinking about it corresponding to this slide over here is pie chart. I'm sure there's a package out there for pie chart, but there isn't actually one in the GGPOP package. <coughs> I think it uses something slightly different. 
but there are other choices, not just on the type of chart that you're going to use. You can change the shape of your data points. You can make the, some of the triangles or squares. You can also, that represents the geom part here. So that's the geometric object. So we're saying geom point. So we want a point, but you can then change what that point looks like. There are other things with the AS that it's kind of meaningless when you write it like that, but in the context of aesthetic, these are attributes that we give to those points, these geom geometric objects. And they can be size and they can be the positions. It is possible to move it on the X axis slightly or the Y axis, but it's also possible to change the colors as well. And I've chosen green on this occasion. Oh, okay. I'm just wondering why. So uh, yes, so the point here for this is that this is just default. So this is what we get in this chart in the bottom right hand corner as default. They're all a particular size, other points, they're all round and they're all black. There's no color differentiation there. You have to code it all. So the basics within G ggplot and um, many other, I think, that's probably a bit of a sweeping statement, many packages is the, the default setup. Um, somebody's got an error. <clears throat> oh dear, but I can see Annie's on the case. So I have mentioned it and I didn't quite, uh, I skipped over it really because there's lots to kind of cover in one particular bit, but this is a function. So when you get these two brackets, uh, an opening and closing round bracket, it denotes often that there's a function. And when you just do one of the opening brackets, the closing one does it automatically in our studio, but it also gives you these hints about what will go into it. Uh, so they've written into these things like data equals, what is the data and mapping. So it gives you a bit of the, um, the ideas of what you're doing. You can have various arguments in your function and you can be explicit. So on this occasion, and it's quite useful to do this with ggplot2, particularly when you're learning, is to be explicit and saying data equals, but you can run it without your data equals. So if I just write capacity underscore AE and then do the plus sign, and then geo point, which is the type of chart I'm running, aesthetics, AS, X equals D cubicles. This is very familiar to the last line that you saw, D weight for Y. For y. The difference here is that I haven't put in the data equals, but it runs. It gets exactly the same thing because there's only one thing expected in that position, which is your data. But it's nice to see it when you're first doing it to remind you what it is that you're doing. The other thing to point out in this plot in the bottom right hand corner of our studio is that you have these arrows again, like you have up here with your scripts and you can navigate between your charts to have a look at what you did previously. And you can see these two are the same. So it doesn't really help too much to see the difference. Oh yes, so the order. So if you write X equals and Y equals, you don't have to put them in the order. You can write them the wrong way around in a sense. You could put Y first and you'll get the same chart. And I have done it. Uh, this is a, a dreadful admission for anybody who's working with charts, just swapping them around like this to see how well they look. And you get a different chart because you've switched it around. Uh, it could be a bit confusing, but it is possible. Sometimes there's quite a lot of possibility with encoding that you can get around. You don't have to let me just see yep yeah. there's often in some of these functions multiple things that you can put into it to say like this one you need a yes you need your x and your y in this context it's expecting two things and the order matters if you don't have it stipulated i'm overriding the order by saying x and y which is the next one this particular one at the top here this is only this takes just one argument it can take others but in this context it's okay with just one thing going into it to give it some information but this is the point when i do the x and the y so if i get rid of the x and, and the y <coughs> you get the chart that way around let me just switch it around so it's correct like that and there you go you don't need all of that x y data equals but it's useful to do so that when you just scan over your code you know what you're getting is that okay? I can see some questions were in the chat, but I think that was something slightly different.
as I sort of showed you on that long list, and here we have tiny little char charticles, I'd say, you can create many different types of charts using the ggplot2 package. So you can do bar charts, lines, box plots, amazing. It's just a couple of lines of code, which is very, very different to using Excel, where you'd have to plot various things and then build it all up, and a histogram. So these are really useful just to look at your data, not really polished, just have a quick look like this, just it's, it doesn't have titles or all that lot, but it's just a nice quick way of seeing what it is that you're, you've got in your bit behind your data. I mentioned before these pluses at the end of your lines of code, these reflect layers. So you can build up many, many layers in your ttplot2 code in your chart, or just the, I think it's, um. Uh, the graphics of, is it graphic? I forgot what the name is. There's a, there's a concept which has kind of been written about in R to build up the layers of uh, your graphical visualization. I can only see the scatter plot with D weight on the X axis. <coughs> Sorry, Helen, do you mean that it doesn't work the, the wrong way round? Or I don't, I don't know. I've got D weight on the X. So if you switched it, D, D, X, it, you don't have to do it that way. He's talking about doing D cubicles on the X instead. I thought it was supposed to say. Um, oh, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Yes, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry. Were we supposed to be plotting histograms or are, are we just still on the schedule? Oh, no. We haven't got to that bit yet. No, it was just this okay, okay. plot. No, we're jumping ahead. <laughs> I haven't got okay, to the histograms yet. You. Next okay, bit. It's <laughs> a so nice interlude in. Thank you. But that's, that's the perfect example of, I've done this, but I want to do this now. And that's what my coding has been for a long time. I learn a little bit and go, oh, but what I want to do, I want to do a box plot. We're coming on to that. So that's fantastic. Um, yes, well, first of all, I'd like you to do a little exercise before we go into the excitement of histograms and box plots. Like we need to do another layer, I think would be really good. <clears throat> so uh, what we need to do is to add a smooth, a geom smooth. And we want you just to have a go. Don't worry if you don't get too far. I will give you this code, which is the bit that I think I've repeated on occasions. So everyone in the chat, you're adding another layer. And just to give you a hint, if you do geom underscore smooth, you'll get some information in there just to have a quick go at just adding your own layer. And then I'll explain it step by step. I'll type it out myself. <coughs> oh, dear. So uh, I'll be quiet for a bit to let people have a go at that. I'll copy the code over there in preparation. I mean, I check to see what the results were on the other one. Anybody on YouTube can now go ahead and just pause on that bit and then go back. So I'm just going to type quietly so that people can see there's a layer. And this is what you should be getting up when you do geom underscore smooth. Which might not be very meaningful. There's a lot of information in there. Random questions, I love random questions. My cursor in R is not just an underline of where I am. How do I get back to the vertical line? Ooh, Charlotte, are you on your own computer or on the cloud? Own PC? Ooh, that's a good random question. I think there's something, is it? Uh, there's a key, isn't there, for overtyping? I've forgotten the name of it. I don't think I have it on my keyboard. You know, when you do, oh, I've forgotten what it's called. Insert. insert. That's it. Thank <laughs> you, Joe. Insert. Yeah, I think it might be the insert key. If you hit that, it changes whether you overtype things or not. Good random question. Is there a reason why autocomplete suggests would stop working on R even though the option is selected? I think timing out might be an option there because I had that there. So if I leave it there and don't move it, it disappears after a while. I think it's just timing out with your autocorrect. And also you just sometimes have to get it 
just right. Uh, oh, I see what you mean in autocorrect. So it doesn't autocorrect these, does it? When you do things like I will just write this in A yes, this is the answer. X equals it doesn't autocorrect. So yes, there's a good point. It doesn't autocorrect everything. <clears throat> You do have that line of code. I wanted you to add in the next line of code so we can sort of see. Oh, OK. Oops. What line is that? So I want you to start with this code. I'm answering somebody who's just it's the private chat to me, so I don't think everybody can see this context. So. You start off with this line of code and then you add a layer, which is actually on the computer now on the screen. Um, you add a layer. So uh, what does it look like when you add it all in? In terms of that autocorrect, it doesn't seem to pick up, and I don't know why, the column headers. So I have to learn how to spell cubicles correctly, <laughs> which I'm not doing a great job of. Y equals D weight, and then run that code. And you should have something fancy like that. Um, I'm just and then I will share that code with everybody, and I'll just talk it talk you through it. So don't worry if you didn't get too far with it. It was just like a quick have a quick go, just getting into a bit of coding on your own. It can be quite tricky, but I'm going to explain it all now. So what we can see on my screen, if I make this big, oh, that's small, big, see resizes, is the plot in the bottom right hand corner, which has now got the dots, but with a line with a darker gray period, period, darker gray space around it. And in this section here in the uh, console, it says, and this is a warning, it's like information, well, it's not even a warning, actually, it doesn't say warning, this is information. So what I was saying about the functions, when you type them in, uh, you get just default things back. So in this regard, it's saying, you didn't say what it is, the method that you required. So I've put in Lois, and that's an explanation of what has been applied to this chart in statistical terms. <clears throat> Sorry. Somebody said in the chat to me, so nobody else can see that I, should I now see D cubicles on the x-axis? Yes, I do not have the gray line or the area. Helen, could you share your code with me to see, to put it in the chat? I can see what, what the issue is with that. And somebody else doesn't get the blue line or the gray as well. Charlotte, if you could also share your code. It could be interesting to see where it is. Okay, now if I just, ooh, hang on. I've got lots here. So I'll take Charlotte's code. And I'm just going to put that underneath mine. So I can see it. It's like spot the difference sometimes on this. So um, ah, it's uh, your thing here is that if you if you see, I'm just sort of waving over the brackets to see where they correspond. And this one is corresponding to this opening bracket here, but there's no closing bracket to this one. So it's just moved it actually. When you did the return, it put it here. It sort of uh, what might I say, indented it quite far across where really this G on smooth, this function is equivalent to this one. If I put in this bracket here and then um, do control indent because it's, it's quite a nice shortcut. You can see it's now equal. So the code for you, Charlotte, needed that bracket. I just put that in the chat for you so that you can see it, there's two brackets at the end of each of the lines, whereas when I had it for yours, there was one here and two here. Another thing you can do, this would be useful for people if you've got the most up to date R Studio and if you're on the cloud, is if you go to view, is it? I'm looking for, I saw it earlier, you can get rainbow brackets, which can help people see where your opening and closing brackets are. And I can't see it at the moment. Yes, I think it's in tools and then global options. It's in tools and global options. Ah, 
Yes, and then you go to code. Code, thank there you. Something there. Is about. it in display? No. Oh, there we go, display, sorry. Rainbow parentheses. Yes, there we go. So if I apply, then you can see all of these now change and they correspond in color. That doesn't always help people, but it can certainly help with brackets. And I can definitely confirm that after several years of coding in R, commas and brackets are always going to be like the first thing to double check all the time. But this formatting that you get can be a bit of a, an indicator that it didn't, when you do your return, it put it too far across. The indentation wasn't quite right. So it kind of gives you that visual cue that it's not quite working. The other code was uh, not shared to everybody. So if you just bear with me, I will. Um, there's a lot there. So. Oops. I wonder if, yes, so that was working. So Helen, that works. That's the first line of your code. I'd put this on the next line just because of its ease of viewing. You, as you can see, you can run ggplot2 and you will see later that you can do other code just all on one line, but it becomes very difficult to read it after a while. So there's a lot of formatting, which is also independent to how you work with things, just so that you can view it line by line. So layer by layer, try to have it on a different line just for ease of viewing it. So that is your first line of code. That was fine. And then you need to add in this thing with the uh, Geom Smooth at the end, which uh, needs to be here. So if I just add to your code, Geom Point, no, no, Geom Smooth, AES, and you just copy the rest. Yep. Okay. So will I copy that in the chart? Sorry. Yes, um, I'll copy that all again into, and I will. Uh, and then what do I delete then in my code? What, sorry? Do, do, I delete, do I delete anything in my existing No, code? the code was fine. You just needed to add a line and then you'll get this. Um, and I'll just put it in the chat so everyone can see. Then you get this kind of like layered of, these are your dots and then you've layered on top a smooth. Um, Charlotte, you don't have the, uh, Charlotte, are you working on a PC yet? I think if you're on a PC and you don't have the latest version of our studio, this is really, really new, rainbow parentheses. Um, and I just recommend if you have IT systems or organization uh, teams that can give you the latest R and R studio, it's you, it, I mean, it's kind of like what sh software should be like. We should get these things because there'll be bugs and patches that are required in the latest versions. That's always going to help IT come around to your way of thinking. You want the latest things, and they should be thinking about security. And having the latest R and R studio is just good practice. It's what we do with Microsoft. We always get the latest updates. My PCs forever do security patches. So I would use that as an excuse to getting the latest. And is that everything for the questions on this? Um, no, I still don't get the third line. You don't get the third line, sorry. Oh, the smooth line, the blue, blue line with the green. Is it showing anything at all? Is it you just getting those? It's just the same. Just just got the D cube on the x axis and the scatter plot, but it's just not giving me that extra bit. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Were you okay sharing your screen? Can you see? Okay. Yes, I can. So. Um, where are you putting, where are you, do do what you were doing. So there it is there. Yep. And then I was just hitting run. Oh, you're highlighting a bit there. Oh, wait a minute. So you Sorry. just need your cursor somewhere in the line though. So you need, it's, it's the two things that you've done. One of them is you've highlighted a bit um, and that will run that highlighted bit. You don't have to do that, but if you do, it only runs that. So you, you should really get an error. And you need to have your cursor within it. It does say, you know, that little plus there, that's suggesting to me in the console that it hasn't finished its code. So, um, yeah. No. yeah. Oh, uh, try running it twice. So do control enter and then control enter again. And then do it again. Just ignore that. Oh, it's still not doing it. Why are you not doing it? 
Cannot our GG plot on the Yeah, it, it's okay. It's because there was the, don't worry, the, don't worry about that error. <laughs> go back onto the line somewhere. Um, go on to put your cursor on line nine. Yep, and then do Control Enter. There we yes. go. Ignore <laughs> all the errors before. That was something else. I'm not quite sure. I think it's because you ran a bit of the code, but ignore that. Okay. You've got it. And isn't it amazing when you get that hit? You see the code and you're like, yeah, not the code, the chart. That's why we, well, one of the reasons why I do it first. Wonderful. Thanks for that. And thanks for persevering. Right. I'm going to see if this still shares. Am I sharing my screen? Yes. Yeah. Say yes. Yay. Every time I'm always worried now. Ah, let me see if I can get this to go across. This got PTSD from the experience. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to go out and back in again. <clears throat> that's what it should look like. And that's what we've seen on people's screens. Wonderful uh, chat. Let me see. Well done, everybody. Brackets are a big issue. Now, back to this bit here. This is not a warning. This is like an information. And I think uh, ggplot2 and maybe dplyr as well do these kind of, the colouring seems like a warning. It's saying, you've done this. It's defaulted just to let you know, because this could be really important statistically. You might not want this wiggly. <laughs> That's not the statistical. There'll be statisticians out there going, oh, it's not wiggly. You might not want the uh, the kind of like the curved shape of the lowest. You might want a linear um, fit, non-linear fit, it says in the chat, says it in there. So I'll do that. I'm going to put in a comma here between these two last brackets, which means I'm going to add in something else into this particular function of geom underscore smooth. And I'm going to write method and it fills it in for me, equals, and um, in quotation marks, I'm going to write LM, and then do the running again. So it's making the line, I'll pop that into the chat. It makes the line straight, and it doesn't give you any indication in this console what method is used, because you've told it what method you're using. And that's just another way of uh, determining what kind of uh, smooth function that you're using stats that you're looking at. And I'll explain how you can find out more, like what, what you can choose, because there are options in these functions that you may not know about. So what is it that you can do within each function? And I will be covering that in the course. There we go. There's another one. It's like it's repeated. Just to take that a bit further, if you look down here, the point of this slide is to say there's something happening here. These two areas have got let me get this right, low weighting and low cubicles. So they really stand out in the chart, which you might not see if you looked at data alone, that there is some sort of something going on here. So the hypothesis that we, we would have quite naturally is that these two staff sites have got something different in their staffing, that there may be staffing increases that have been an extra variable in there that have made them stand out as outliers in a sense if you can call them out lies. Um, so we can map this to try and highlight them more by using color. And we can add that to the particular column information, which was staff increase, true or false, one or zero. So it's binary. And the way to do that is basically, this is the same code, but within the geom point, not the smooth. I'm going to add in a color and I'm going to put in a comma, actually it's within this bit here. So within these two brackets here, the green brackets on my screen, I'm going to put a comma before those two end. brackets and brackets is really difficult and I get very muddled with these and I'm going to write color now just to point out you don't have to write color in the UK British way or British way I'm not sure which one's right that way you can write it as color without the u but it's nice and um uh what's it called not diverse inclusive that we can write uh, color with a u and summarize with an s I just like that so much because I do it too many times, I think. And I'm going to put staff increase in there. I will copy that code so that you can all use that and see that on your screen. So the key bits here is the commas and the brackets and where you put it into which function, because there are a number of functions in ggplot. And you can see there are different colors here. The two down here do show as true. There has been an increase. There's also been an increase over for this third one, but it has worked here. Maybe there's something else actually that's going on there. Maybe it's been a huge increase. I don't know. Saying yes, it's increased could be by two people. It could be by 50 people. 
And so that helps by looking at the chart to see how the data fits together. I'll skip over this slide. It's more about the brackets and the commas and that you can, and just to give you a warning that sometimes code works in R and I've experienced this, particularly if you go into the realms of shiny as well with dashboards and it's not actually right, but sometimes R allows you to do things. So this is about the colors and whether you put it in one section or another section, but I won't go into that. You can read that slide at your leisure if you're doing colors in your charts or you could refer to the uh, R for data science book as well because there's a lot of stuff or somebody else's code. I want to apply a size globally to this. Uh, so instead of this color here, I am going to do to the points, uh, I'll actually just copy this whole code, I think. I'm going to take out that color and that comma. So that is my plot, so it's all black. And then on this occasion, it's between the two brackets at the end. And I'm going to put that onto a new line just so that it's kind of obvious what I'm doing. I'm a bit cautious about whether this is going to work. Well, it does work. And then I'm going to copy that for you. And so now you can see they're huge. It doesn't look that great in this chart, but it just gives you that flexibility of making things bigger and just shows you the size. It's all about layering. But what you've noticed, and if people are kind of script programmers using SQL or something else, you'll have quickly noticed that we've repeated ourselves here. And it, the more you repeat yourself, the, the more danger there is of things either needing debugging or if you change the name of a column, you have to change it in multiple places. But just to read through this code, we've got ggplot, which is your plotting function, data equals capacity underscore AE. And instead of putting each of the lines with the AES in it, I'm going to write it in the global, which is the first bit. So that first line where I take my data, I can also add in what the X and Y is because I'm repeating those X and Y's in two layers. So if I do X equals, no, nope, I'll do AES actually, sorry. See, I'm not really paying attention to my own slides here x equals d cube equals and y equals d weight. I put that onto two separate lines just because it's nice and neat, not because of any other reason. Put a plus at the end and I'm going to say g on point, which is the dots. So that is the function for points, but nothing else in there because it's going to take it from here. And underneath g on smooth, again, with empty brackets. And now I get my chart. So what I've done, I'll just share that code as well, is move them. So you can write it like this. This is absolutely fine. It's just that if you change your decubicles column, you'll have to type it in multiple places. You can do search, find, and replace. But it just makes it a bit easier and a bit clearer to move it into the global. Is that OK? And you might want to do different things so the layering means that you can put other information in as well so you could do multiple points don't know where, when you would but you could do a line on top of a point referring to different data and things like this there's a lot of flexibility with it and this is my favorite bit so if you followed me to this bit and think yeah it's okay i can do charts but really excel power bi tableau clicks they are easier to get your charts all set out that's fine this is one of the reasons why I'd say to persevere with ggplot2. This is what kept me going until I sort of got where these x's, y's, brackets and commas and things all went. A very small piece of code called facet wrap. So if I just type out ggplot again, data equals capacity. No, there we go. And put the plus at the end. Geom point. So you've, you've seen this many times now. AES x equals d cube equals. Just to point out as well, you could see on mine, I put the spaces between things, but maybe you notice when other people shared their code that they didn't. It works. I just like the spaces because it makes it readable to me, but it works without those particular spaces between your pluses and your commas and your brackets. I just like it all spaced out, but it works. Ah, before I do that, that is your chart. It's quite basic in this regard. But if you imagine that you've changed the colors and you've done uh, headers and you've made it all nice and done lots of things to it, if you then put plus at the end and then facet 
wrap. And then it's a tilde that is next to your return key, often on your keyboard, that squiggly line. <clears throat> and now I'm going to put increase in there. I've got the same chart now split into two. It's, it's not a huge example because there are only two things within that particular column, binary, yes or no. But you can hopefully quickly imagine the excitement you get because I get very excited by this. If you had 100 wards or 50 incident areas, you have a beautiful chart that you spent a long time creating and then you can facet it, you can then repeat it according to all of those different organizations, teams, instant groups, all sorts of things with just one line of code that deserves its own dance often when you're at your keyboard. You see analysts doing this a lot when they're like, yay, facet wrap. I still get very excited by that. You have some functionality within your facet wrap as well to change how that's viewed. So if we do n col, which means number of columns equals one, oops, you then move it from being side by side, which is default to being on top of each other. And it just depends on the view, which ones that you want. Um, so there are other things within that particular function <clears throat> that mean that you have more flexibility of things. I'm going to quickly demonstrate geom charts. Then I think it's a probably break off for lunch, I think. So this is where I'll just show some examples of things. I'll type them out and read them as I do them and copy them into the um, chat for you just to copy so that you can see it on your screen as well. But ggplot, if you want to type it out with me, data equals, as you've been doing all along, capacity, look at me, I can't type, plus at the end. And we're going to do the geom histogram now. If I can type it, you only need to put in D weight for this one. And then you get this uh, chart. Now, the not warning, but information here is it's saying that the bin width is uh, default and that you probably want to pick a better bin width so that you can see it more uniform in its spread, as it says in the, the uh, slide. Um, oh, so I missed that. So I put in to that particular function bin width. bin width, I did think, why did I say that? Bin width, sorry, 10. And there you go. It doesn't give you that information anymore because there's no default. And now it's all more uniformly spread. And I'll share that in the chat as well. <clears throat> bin width, interesting. Bar plots are a very common one as well. So we're repeating ourselves. ggplot equals data equals capacity. <coughs> capacity, oh dear. capacity underscore AE plus geom col. So really for columns, but this is bar charts. Aesthetics uh, is X equals site and Y equals attendance on this occasion so that you can see all of this, which is nice, but it's, it's not very easy to interpret. But you can reorder within your ggplot too. And this is an example of reorder. Um, was, you could either reorder it outside of your data, your chart. So when you're sorting up your data, manipulating it, shaping it, these are words that are used a lot with R, you can then do the ordering in there, or you can do it directly within your chart. So if I just move that onto a new line, you have to reorder by two things. So we've got site, and attendance 2018 because you're using the two at the x and the y i think and then it looks like this so you have a lot of flexibility for doing some data manipulation within your ggplot2 which is nice but this is my favorite my favorite chart because it's very very difficult to well it's not it just takes a long time and then if you wanted to do it for multiple sites multiple places it's is quite a lot in Excel. <clears throat> so that's the first line that you're familiar with. Data equals capacity underscore AE. Look at geom box plot. And we're going to look at staff increase by D weight. Now this is when it comes into its own because then you can have a quick look to see, is this something that is worth pursuing? Does this have any significance that we should look at? Interpreting a box plot is something else in itself, <laughs> but um, it's very quick to do. Just one line of code rather than lots of moving and manipulating. 
And then that frees you up a bit of time to then think, okay, well, it hasn't got a title. So we can do labs, which are the title functions. Title itself equals do changes in staffing. I'm just copying it. And these are in comma, the quotation marks, but just to highlight a couple of things with this, I'm gonna do this with the waiting. When you do one quotation mark, it does the end of it, but you can use single quotation marks and also you can mix them. Now, I have seen in some places, some style guides that some people or some groups and some teams prefer one over the other, but it's just to show you the flexibility that your quotations, particularly in R, can be double, they can be single, I think, and I'm just testing because this is part of what's lovely about programming is you can just give things a go. Nope, it doesn't work with that. I was just seeing if back ticks work. They don't. <coughs> but there we go. I will share that with you. So there is a lot of flexibility with it, but I haven't mentioned this, but everybody's been doing OK so far. Well, <coughs> not me. With my cough. Is that. <coughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> R is very case sensitive. So it sees things as being different depending on where you put your capitalization. So if you had waiting with a capital W or a little w, there were two separate things in the categorization. So it's very, very precise on case sensitivity, but not so precise when it comes to uh, quotation marks. And you'll probably want to save your plots unless you're going to do, as we will cover later, uh, our markdown where everything's created in that report. So it mixes your charts and things together. Sometimes you want to produce a chart and then put that somewhere else, either in Word or in a PowerPoint presentation separately. And there are a couple of ways of doing it as ever, but this is one particular way where you're using your code. So at the bottom of this box plot, I'm just going to add another layer and use this um, function called ggsave. And I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it plot underscore name dot png. I'll share that code with you. So you can just run that all yourself. And the way to see that it's in there. Now, I'm not sure about this error. It says that, but it does save. So on my cloud, I can now see plot underscore name dot png. I haven't really figured out why it says that error, saying it can't save it. So if you're on the cloud, you will get that error but you'll also see plot, whatever you've named it, to be fair. If you've called it plot underscore name, that will be what it's called. And that's what it looks like. And it opens it up in <coughs> the web browser. It also saves it in a pretty good resolution. Like you can tell that it, it's a big image, like not yes. that quality. Yeah. yeah. So the next bit is as well, because it's huge, is to... Um, control the kind of the what's it called the dimensions of it so first of all we need to change the units to centimeters because i think they default to cent, cent uh, no get there inches and i'm going to make this i'm just copying it it says height equals 10 so the 10 doesn't need to be in quotation marks because it's a number so it doesn't need is not a string it's not a character it's a it's got a different value to it and eight so you can't see it necessarily there let me see if that works better still got this great resolution it's really big but i think it's changed in size <clears throat> oh i'll just share that with everyone the other thing you can do in our studio which this doesn't actually cover in the slides is when you get your plot which is here if you go to export in the plots part of the bottom right hand part of our studio and then save as image it comes up with another wizard Oops, and then you can resize it within there to make it the size that you want and it changes the width and the height. You can change the plot name and where it goes if you've got directory access, say if you're on your um, computer. So that can be quite useful, but it can be quite fiddly uh, if you're trying to get the right level and stuff. So, excuse me. <clears throat> Just to give a shout out for our, our markdown, you have a it's a bit easier to sort of manipulate the size of your charts as a in your output in your report output, but that is an option. You can also zoom in your chart as well. So if you, I mean, it's quite straightforward with the box plot, but if you wanted to really get into it, you can see there's a dot there. You can zoom, and that would pop out in that bit like it we did with the the data. <clears throat> 
Oh, any questions from that? And I think we will cover what will the function do after some lunch. I think people probably are desperate for a break. I kind of zoomed through. Um, everybody's okay. I'm going to pause. Okay, and now we're back from the lunch session. I'm going to launch into what does a function do? I sort of mentioned it at the last uh, sessions, in the last sessions, and you'll see a lot of this, but it's just to give you a bit more of an understanding of what it is. I think I'll make this bigger so that you can just take the screen off. <clears throat> We've kind of seen a few of these bits in the morning bit a session about um, getting some information when you sort of hover over some of the, the names of functions, or sometimes they're referred to as verbs in some contexts of um, like dplyr, which we're going to do in a second. Uh, but let me see, actually, I don't want the whole screen. I want it to be shared with the other bit. There we go. Um, one of the ones that we looked at really, really briefly at the very end, just before lunch, where I was kind of like scooting towards food, was GG Save. And knowing what kind of options were in there, uh, we also discussed a few other ones where you wouldn't necessarily know what you can possibly put into them and could affect. So there are a couple of ways, I said this a few times, and I said I would say it a few times, of finding that out. Now, the first possible way is like I did when I was showing the, uh, when I wrote capacity, I'll just write that capacity underscore AE, and then ran that. You see that in the console. You can also just write out the function in this regard, in this instance, sorry, with the brackets at the end of it, and run that, uh, not control, not run it, sorry. I'm ahead of myself. Instead of running it, if you do F1 on your keyboard, when you've got your mouse cursor somewhere in the function name, it comes up with the information down in the bottom right hand quadrant of our studio. You can also write in the help, you can look for things in there. So I do geom box plot. We can get information there. When I select it, it opens up the help files. This is a really useful area when you're offline because it's all built into the packages that you've installed. So you can just look quickly for the information that you're trying to find. It tells you, um, that's not a great example because there's a lot there, but it tells you what you can feed into that function. And what I tend to do, because there's lots of information that I didn't quite understand for a long time, this is a big one, is skip right to the bottom where it gives you examples which for me, as a, I just find that a little bit easier to, to work out using something that's already set out. But <clears throat> there's a lot of information above about what each and every parameter, as they call them, can be about. So if I just do uh, GG save again, um, that's a bit shorter in what can go in. So you can see a few of the bits like the width and the height, the units. You can also put them in millimeters or PX, which is interesting. Didn't know that. And it's a bit shorter and it's possibilities. I think ggplot stuff tends to have a lot of possibilities in each of the functions. And there's a few examples there. Some of the examples are usually built in as well. So you've got this data set um, called MT cars, which I just realized as you say it out loud what it means. <laughs> and that's sometimes I think these are data sets that are built into R. So they're accessible without having to import or upload or install any packages. There is one particular data set uh, about petals and irises, the iris data set, just to give you some warning that people are trying to move away from that because of its connections with Fisher and eugenics. So people are uh, trying to use things like penguins, which actually does require data sets to be imported, but MT cars can go in. I really struggle with it because it's about cars. If you give me healthcare data, I can work that one out. But cars, I, I just can't work out. Anyway, deviating onto data sets rather than functions in this. There are a couple of other ways of finding out what the function may mean. And in the console, you can just type directly. I know we've been doing it previously in the editor and it's been going to the console. You can just write your code directly there. It just doesn't get saved. So just to reinforce pi times two, it runs in the console just with a return rather than control and return because it's, um, I could, uh, I've forgotten what they're called, like terminal, um, command line, it's like command line. So if I do a question mark and gg save, I don't need the brackets on that, but when I do return, then it opens up the help session. If you're trying to open up a 
function in another package that you haven't loaded in this session. And in this example, I'm using this one called BPAR, which is a sound, an audible sound package. It has very, uh, it's a very small package, which you run a bit of code. It's quite useful when you've got long lines of code and you're just running it and you want to go and focus on a different screen. <coughs> if you put the sound at the very end, you can just have it run once it's finished the main code runs that one and it makes a sound little things like mario or um, computer noises but if you just want to know the function on this occasion it's beep if you do two question marks beep r that's telling them the package that's required and now you can see i've got these things popping up and if i do that then it opens up, it gives me a few options because I haven't loaded that file and it should be available to those on the cloud. It won't be available necessarily to those on your PC because this is a package that you haven't been asked to install. It's an example. It's a very useful package, but you may not really want this one. The reason why, um, let me see if you do a single uh, question mark. Beep. I think it might work because I've given it the um, the pathway with this double colon. But if I do single and beep, single beep, oh, it finds it. Does it find it? No, it doesn't find it. The double question mark, for those who use SQL, who are familiar with temporary tables, if you use a hash, a single hash in that context is opening it within your context of your working environment. If you double hash, it makes it global. And this is the same for these double question marks. Single one, is in your own area. What have you loaded? Where's the function we can find it? But if it's not been loaded, but it's available globally, the two question marks takes it out, just to uh, kind of explain that. <clears throat> if you're online, another great source of information on functions and what's possible is, um, sorry, somebody just said capacity underscore AE, and I'm not sure what the context was, if they're answering something else. Um, if you're looking for some information on the function, how to use it, what the, what's possible in it, what like with the uh, smooth, the geom smooth, what can you do with the Lois or the LM uh, modeling, you can go to Stack Overflow. Now, some people have probably encountered that when they've been doing some, I think even Excel maybe on there, some programming things. It's okay. Um, and what have, there are a couple of other places as well as Stack Overflow. It's kind of got a reputation of not necessarily being wholly friendly <coughs> i found it to be better for r than for maybe other things and there is a bit of a strategy on how to find your r solutions in sac overflow but there's also r studio community which i'll just open and while it loads i will say that this is a particular community which is very very friendly the downside of it are the questions are only open for a certain amount of time and then they get closed, but they are really uh, focused on being friendly and accessible and helpful. So no question is a stupid question. And if you haven't quite asked it in the right way, you'll get help to ask it, not just uh, sort of like a clear return saying you need to do this or can we write this better? People try to be really nice. I would say also the same for NHSR Slack group, which uh, got a 404 error, which is interesting. I think I have it open over here anyway. <clears throat> so this is, um, oh, I was replying to somebody over there. I was replying to that one. So Slack, if you're not very familiar with it, there's a lot of channels that we've all set up. Uh, we use them in varying degrees. The general, when you go into it, there's a thousand people in here. We've also got book clubs and stuff, but the one you'd probably want is help with R. And we've got various questions. Look, I've asked one here. You know, I've, I've been doing this for a while and I've, been teaching it but I still have lots of questions and there's a lot of people who have such a wide range of experience from people who are very familiar to, with base R, people who use another package that I'll refer to called data table and so there's just so many responses it's amazing and everybody wants to be so very helpful and um, friendly and I'm just trying to remember which uh, there we go which one I was on no that wasn't it where am I I've lost my slides. What did I do with my slides? I can probably find them again. I'm on the wrong bit. Mm, that's why. No. Oh dear. <clears throat> Give me a second while I find my slides. I think I've got too much open. I really want this one, don't I? I can't find it. 
I think I've opened it and then got lost. So I'm just going to open it again. <clears throat> we were in. Oh, look how much we've done. Du, du, du. What does this function do? It helps us remember where we were. Right, let's go through these. Du, du, du. Right, so there are cheat sheets as well. So those are the three kind of options when you're online for finding out what functions are. And I'll be talking about Stack Overflow again in the future. NHS, our Slack group, doesn't have much of um, a history because we haven't got a paid subscription. So just bear that in mind if you're looking for historical things. It's not structured in the same way as the other question answers. It's just a friendly community that likes to ask each other questions. Cheat sheets are also very useful. They're all in PDF, which is not very accessible. And there are lots of them, and I haven't necessarily used them myself, but they're quite good for having, and I can, I can never navigate this when I've gone onto it, but I'm just going to show the picture here. Um, it's just, so if you're using a package like ggplot2, it'll have all the main functions in there and what they do, just to give you some examples. So that's a, a useful thing to use. And finally, it's useful to save your script, which is why we were using scripts as opposed to using things just directly into the in the um, console. And to do so, you can use the shortcut keys, which you would do in many, many other programs, particularly Microsoft, which is Control and S I use just to save or file and then save or save as. And when you save it, um, I'm going to save this as my script. Dot R. I think if you're saving it, let me just try it without the dot R. I think it will know it's an R script because that's what we opened as a template. So you don't actually have to do dot R. You can do, but it knows it. Um, there we go, my script dot R. And you can just save it as you go along. Control S is what I tend to do. Recommended reading. We've already recommended this one, which was R for data science. But if you particularly are interested in visualizations, there's a lot of stuff there. And there's two books in particular, which are available online free. And you can also get paperback copies as well. But I'm going to do a little interlude now. Uh, I can't show you all of this because I've got, very, I'm laughing because I've got very strict uh, Wi-Fi. It's my husband set this up. So I can't see one of these, these art things, but I will show what I can. If I were on the VPN, my virtual private network, I'd probably be able to do that. But um, on this occasion, this I'm on Twitter, so that's OK. I don't need to do that, but I don't know how to get rid of that bar at the bottom. This is Accidental Art, which is a Twitter account. When people are creating things, they sometimes make mistakes. But this is a celebration of those mistakes. I quite like this one. Oh, I like looking at these. That was not intended, but there's a there's a kind of beauty about these things. So people share their mistakes as if, you know, like, let's, let's get it out there. It's nice. That's a nice way of just saying these things happen. And isn't this quite nice? It has its own beauty. <clears throat> but there are people who do computational art and they do it either for hobbies or they just do this themselves. You know, they just do a lot of stuff. And Danielle Navarro is... Um, I think her role's changing on Twitter, she was saying recently. She's in academia at the moment, but she's a data scientist and she does amazing uh, visual art using R, which I have said on previous occasions, I don't know of any other program that does that. That's probably not true. It's just that I've not been exposed to it. I think some of this is just fabulous and amazing. She doesn't share all of her code because some of this was also kind of commercially done. I think she was selling, I think, some of her things, but um, some of it may be shared. Uh, it's just amazing. So people are having fun, being creative, but also learning when they're doing this. It's, it's I can't do this one, which is another person's because I've got secure network on my system. Um, but this is a lovely, I've, I've copied that code, which is what's in my slide. And I like this as well. So this is how to, these are slides on how to create your own art using this kind of template function of, computational art so using some of the the maths behind it it's loading slowly which is a bit awkward and you can see the event was our ladies but santa barbara there are our ladies events all across the world which everybody is welcome to but it's a showcase for people who are uh, female or identify as such or from minority groups so it's more about amplifying the voices but people are not excluded it's just a, a great thing and people do also share their recordings from it or their slides 
so I like this art that's produced by this person so much and she shared a bit of the code in here with algorithms and quite simple cheeky plot I say simple uh, it's not that simple but um, it's nice to play around with and I think by doing this and it, having a purpose and something that's inspiring can help you learn more about visualizations I quite like and we're going to cover this in dplyr data manipulation that's my area of fun uh, but this may be yours and so this is why I'd like to sort of share this and I just love their pictures I love that they share this and people do this as well where they try to emulate or they um replicate what's gone in the past with visualizations so you might have seen things like Florence Nightingale's coxcomb chart which people have I think misappropriated to pie charts they've created those in R um, the I'm just trying to think of things. I'm not great with uh, remembering details. Uh, I think if you've seen it in another context, people have tried it in R. And I think people do this as a kind of like test of their skills and something to puzzle out. There's a thing called Tidy Tuesday as well, where people get these data sets and then they try and do some, they, they, they do their own visualizations. They sort of like see what they can see in it. And that's all for fun. <clears throat> right. Oh, and that's the end of that slide. So I'm trying to emphasize with this, that this is very serious stuff, but you can also have a lot of fun with, uh, I'm not on the wrong slide, with R and R stats. And by doing so, you also extend your own knowledge of things by having a go with things. But this is my particular favorite, and this doesn't look so uh, lovely on a screen. You don't know, they go, don't get so much of a wow factor. I don't know why, just I just like cleaning data. It comes from my days of working with SQL, I think. Another really great picture from Alison Horse with data wrangling. That's a word that's used or words that are used quite a lot in the context of R stats, as they call it, hashtag R stats, where you're trying to get your data into a decent shape, you know, cleaning it up, removing nulls, maybe if you need to, or removing blank spaces, um, all sorts of stuff that we will cover a little bit of as we go through this. There's a more succinct way than I was explaining. It's about reshaping or transforming your data very rare to get a data set that is really tidy, particularly in our working environments with the NHS or even social care. There's always something interesting in there that needs sort of cleaning data quality and things. And that's something I quite like. Just to uh, reflect again on the tidy data, I use that just quite, you know, quickly there in my language, you get quite used to using the tidyverse context of tidy data, but that extends across all the packages and also across languages. So as I was saying before, SQL relational data is tidy data often. It's very long, it's not very easy to read as a, as a human because you've got to read down the page. That's tidy data because we can do more with it in other programs or packages if you're in R. I'm going to get a, a new script while I'm on here. I don't know quite what I've done with my thing here, but I'm just going to go to file, new file and do R script. So I just got a new one just for this particular section. You can continue in your other one or do a new one as I have done too. I'm going to also get rid of that because it will be a bit tidier. Um, dplyr is the package that we're going to cover, which is the prominent uh, data manipulation package. It's in tidyverse. Lots of people refer to it. It can be computationally slow sometimes. So there, I did mention Briefly, there are other ways of doing uh, data manipulation, one of them being BASAR, which is very fast, and also a data table, which has different syntax. It's very useful, but it's a different way of thinking. But this is very familiar to, it will be very familiar to those who are SQL users. And it also has a better reading kind of way of doing it. You're reading it like you would, you're reading your flow better. It has a bit more of a, a natural flow within the language. But I will explain a bit more as I go through five there are more verbs as they call them verbs are also in uh, sort of in lieu of functions they're the same thing verbs and functions are the same thing sorry and verbs in dplyr <clears throat> is used predominantly in dplyr i think and we're going to use five i think it's actually more <laughs> i think i've not counted one but there's like smaller ones we will refer to them as we go along but we're going to solve a problem of, well, we're going to look at the mental health inpatient capacity data, which again, it's real data. And uh, it's also got, does it say here on the slide? Yeah, partially cleaned. So there are real problems in it that are still out there in the world. And we're going to go through that. It comes from NHS England statistics website. 
and it's about the bed numbers and capacity by organization. It's quite old and my trust actually does feature in it, but it's, uh, it's from 2013, so things have changed quite a lot since that data came out. I skipped ahead, it looks like. I set up a new script. So if you're on your PC, it's Control Shift and N if you're using a keyboard shortcut, or Control Shift Alt and N if you're on the cloud. But I just went to File, New File, and Script, R Script. Or you can use that little shortcut icon and then select it there. And we're going to load the, the data beds data underscore beds underscore data CSV. I'll just launch into it. <clears throat> Where before I went into the import uh, menu, I'm going to do as I sort of mentioned briefly to people to get the, get there faster. Is if you click on the file, you can see you don't need to go through the wizard and then browse to it because you've told the programming there's the program itself where to go. So I'm just going to import data set and I'll get the same wizard as before, but it gets the data straight away because it knows where I'm looking. And it's a good chance to look at the data. It would help if I looked at the right file, <laughs> excuse me, beds underscore data dot CSV. <laughs> That's a good preview. Script on the screen is too small. Okay. Uh, Oh, you mean this this bit here, the wizard? I'm not sure. Can I change that? I think that's a setting on the computer. Mm. I can never work out how to make my screen zoom in it's like a magnifier. No, when I selected the file, this one. Oh, let me get rid of this. Sorry, I'm dragging it around in a haphazard way. This bit's not big enough. Let me do tools, options, or global options on the cloud and make this 14. Hmm, it doesn't, it made this bigger, but not this here, very much bigger. So I, I don't know how to, I think I have to zoom in differently. I'm look, I just click on, you're not going to really navigate too much in this area, but I'm clicking specifically on the file called beds underscore data dot CSV. Instead of searching for it, you get two options when you click with your left mouse key, view file and import data set dot dot dot. And I've clicked on that. It goes straight into the wizard, which then shows you the data files. So sorry about that. There are bits that I think are not, they're kind of like the program I need to make bigger and that's not very useful. Sorry about that. Um, you can't quite see now this, uh, let me try and make it bigger on this side. If I make this a bit smaller, don't worry about not being able to see the slides. Uh, just look at the one on the left. I'm just trying to use it to view myself a little bit clearer. I'm doing this import data set a few times. There we go. So we can see it just a bit bit more space on there. It's made that a bit bigger, but not the rest. So it says we notice that something isn't quite right with this. And this is very common with lots of our national return data sets or Office of National Statistics. There are often these bits of metadata above the column headers or spaces. This is a, a line which has got nothing in it. And that's not very useful when we're machine reading. It's also not very useful for those who rely upon screen readers to read for them. So it's, it's poor practice. And it's something that will be changing for some of the government bodies like Office of National Statistics, but it will take a while to do. But in the meantime, we have to clean this. So those gaps are meaning that our titles for the columns, the column headers are really coming down on line three and you can skip your lines which I think would be quite familiar for those who have used a few um, import wizards let's say in Excel and if you click off the three when you just write three in the skip field it doesn't do anything you have to click out of it and then it resets it all and now everything's kind of shoved the, the metadata has gone and the column headers are now the headers themselves well we, you know the column row is now the header so it's moved up so hopefully everybody will have followed that. But the other bit to see in your code is that you've got this skip equals three in the code. So the action in the wizard has become code that you can copy. There is a very, very important thing here is that the date, dates are a terrible thing in many, many programs. The, this is a character. And I think the problem with this is because these are UK format dates from a CSV file, which is a month 
day, month, year, I don't think it's read it correctly. And that can be quite commonly done in many different fields and programs. So we need to tell it, the program, that this is not a character. If you click on the, there's a little arrow next to the character on it, you can select what it should be. And I'm going to select date. But I'm going to pause at this bit of screen here and wait for everyone to catch up so that you can see that it says, please enter the format string. It's quite important because when you look and filter by dates later, they have to be seen as dates in the right format. At the moment, this is a US format. We're telling the program what the format is, not what we want it to be, but what it is. So it's offering us US, which is month, day first. And we need to swap that round. Oops. <clears throat> I don't think you can see that because I've hidden it, haven't I? I think it's. Yeah, it says in the blue bit here that you can see. Sorry, the, the original bit here is what you can see on my screen. <laughs> Look, I've made my screen so tiny, not even I can read it. You want it to be date, month, year. And now it's gone into this format, which is a universal date format, year, month, date, backwards in a sense. That doesn't look so familiar to people who are much more uh, reliant upon things like Excel, um, maybe even Power BI to be fair, but it is a universal format. So if you're giving this to other users, you um, can change the format, say in our markdown to what they see, but for internal use, I have, uh, I have been asked this and I think it's useful to know because people think it's not possible to do. It is possible to change the format to say, date slash month slash year, but you have to change your computer formats because it's the standard kind of practice is universal format. Those who use uh, SQL might be more familiar with this because quite a lot of database administrators always like to have that kind of year, month, date because it's unambiguous. I'll also point out that there's a lot more code down here that's popped up, which is saying what the column type is, that you've made it into a date and the format, what it was to then change it, skip three. So if I copy that bit of code in the middle, as I did before, just control C to copy it, cancel. I'm going to put this at the top just because it's good practice, but it's already run because it's already in my whole um, workspace that I'm working in. It could help if I could spell tid tidyverse there. Just to point out, if I run that again, it doesn't tell me all the stuff again that I, I'm installing, all that masking. It just does that line. It doesn't do anything. It just reinstalls it. It not reinstalls it, reloads it. I must use the right terminology. Sorry about that. Uh, and it, it doesn't break anything. So if I copy that code that I um, took from the script and do control enter, because that's my favorite way of working it, I now have two objects, as they call them, in the environment. One, which is the capacity underscore AE, which we worked with before, and one, which is beds underscore data. And if we look at it, which is what it says on this screen, look at the data, beds underscore data, Control and enter, and I can see here in the editor, the top 10, which looks a bit like this, which is a, a nicely format table, but it's the same data. Dplyr key verbs that we're going to cover today. What I've done is put this in the format of the um, package, which is a bit like a file name really, it's package, colon, colon, then the function name, just to be clear about it. You don't necessarily, again, you don't need that package bit, you can just run it as you can see, as we will work on. It's just to be clear about it, as you saw in the not warning, but the kind of information when you first load Tidyverse, how to not be ambiguous about whether your filter is from the dplyr package or from the stats package. So we're going to look at arrange, filter, mutate, group by, and summarize. A few of those will be self explanatory, and a couple of them will be quite strange, like mutate. That's a strange word, isn't it? I'm going to introduce this in the context of a, an analogy. So where we are doing recipes, there's quite a lot of this crossover playing on things, I think, when we're explaining R, maybe other languages as well. We use recipes and knitting and these kind of words come out. I think that's a general programming term. But um, we're going to talk about making mashed potato. So we start off with our object, which is the potato. I think I started there with the technical term of object rather than the analogy term of potato. Then we peel it, that's an action, and then you slice it into medium pieces and then you boil for 25 minutes and then you mash it. I have got, you know, in real life, those the wrong way around. And that does mean that you're trying to mash something that's not cooked, it doesn't work. But that's the point in this, it's in order. This is how you would do it step by step in a recipe. 
I have actually said object. I like objects. Potato is your object. It's the R object in this analogy. Peel is the function. It's a verb. It's an action. And you don't really peel. It doesn't it's not like peel vigorously or peel slowly. It's just just peel it. So it's an empty function. It does something, but you don't need to tell it how to do it or add anything in there. When you slice something, you can determine how you slice it, whether it's small, medium or large. And we've put this size equals medium in this particular context. And the same for boil. You can stipulate the time so we can set a parameter in there of how long it is for. And on this occasion, 25, assuming they're minutes, I guess. And then your output is the mashed potato. So you've got an altered object, went from solid potato to mashed potato. Instead of using then, in R, we use this strange symbol, which is a <clears throat> percentage and then right arrow and then percentage sign again. It's, um, it actually comes from another package called Magritar. Um, Magritte being the uh, painter, I was about to say author, the painter who drew a pipe, paint, didn't draw, painted a pipe and said, is it a pipe or not? I think this is another play on words. It's a shorthand for then, for some people, this is how I interpret it. And it's very, very popular to flow your work. It's like the layers we saw in ggplot2 where you do one thing and this now needs to follow it. So you're not running it line by line by line, unconnected. It goes from one to the next to the next. So you're going data frame, which is your object or your potato, then do this, then do that, then. And so you've got this strange symbol, which just does, the, does this. The connection between dplyr and tidyver, not tidyver, G, ggplot2 using a plus sign and dplyr using a pipe, as it's called, with this funny symbol, because uh, it's piping your data across. It's been unfortunate that they're not the same, and I think they have lamented that. But as with most things, when we get started with it, I don't think they quite realized how closely these two things would be together. So they're just still separate, although they have the same concepts, they don't have the same sort of like flowing symbol. You can use these verbs uh, repeatedly in different orders to solve a, a complex problem. So they're simple things that you build up over time and, and sort of like flow from one to the other to the other. And as I say, you can repeat them as well. It's not like if you filter it once, you can't filter it again. You can do it multiple times for different things. So using dplyr, um, we're going to start with a, a number of questions to sort of interrogate this data, and I'll be talking you through it and showing you examples of the dplyr verbs as we go along uh, to explain how we do this. So the question could be quite a common one that you would get, which is you've got this data set, which organisation provided the highest number of mental health beds? And one of the simplest, and you could probably work this out, verbs is arrange. So it's like sort by Nope, is that right? Oh, okay, order by in, oh, that's right. Order by in SQL and sorting, which is more the action in Excel. Doing really well with my languages today. So writing out, as I did before, beds underscore data, and it finds it. Now, when I do the um, the pipe, that's actually, some people do type it out, uh, but I like my shortcut keys. I think this only saves one keystroke, but I do it automatically now. And it's control shift and M for mic, and it does the pipe for you. Now, I just want to remove that and just show you, if you notice, my cursor was right next to the A of the name of the object. And when I did Control, Shift and M, it spaced it nicely so it didn't squash it all together. It knows uh, where it is and then it adds a space. If I'd already put the space in, it doesn't put in an extra space. It just it has it all neatly formatted for me. So that's quite nice. You can do it all on the same row, as I said previously, it will all run, but I'm going to put it on the next line because it just looks nicer for me to read as a person. And arrange is the function. I want to arrange the data and I want to arrange it by, and it finds it, beds underscore AV, which is this column, the fourth column in the data set. And if I do control and enter, I get some more data coming down into the console. Control, shift and M, thank you. <coughs> and we can see the top 10 files and you will not be able to answer that question that we had which was oops the highest number of mental health beds because this is the lowest number it looks like two being quite a small number there we go it defaults to ascending order 
So as we had as we had with other functions, if you don't stipulate some things, it defaults, which can be very useful. But on this occasion, we don't want that one. We want it the other way around. So we just add in one other bit. I'm going to write it all out though. Beds underscore data, which is your object. Control Shift and M, a mic, which is the pipe. And then next line, arrange. And instead of just doing beds underscore AV, well, I will actually write that because I'm going to show you another thing. If I highlight the word and then do uh, an open bracket while it's highlighted, if you were in Word, it would just overtype it, for example. But in our studio, it knows that you're doing a bracket around it. So I've got a closing, opening and closing bracket around it. And then between those two brackets, I'm writing descent. I will share that code. But it's very useful to see some of those kind of things that it does. It knows that you're doing one of these brackets. It'll do the closing one for you. So when I run that, control and enter, all the data is now switched around to what we want, which is descending order. Desk down here in this tiny bit on the code here on the, not the code, the presentation slide says that desk works for text and numeric values, which is useful. So we were doing it on numeric values, but you can also do that for text. Ooh, I highlighted the wrong bits there. There we go. That's what we want. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. <clears throat> the next question, which two organizations provided the highest number of mental health beds in September 2018? Breaking down the question, because there's a lot in there. Highest number is what we looked for before with a range, but we require only the observations in the date, which is why the date format was really key earlier. We need to get the format right, not a character, but a date and the right format. And we're going to use possibly what is a self-explanatory verb, which is filter or where clause if you're in SQL, or I suppose it would still be filter if you are in, it'd be those arrows, they click and drop in Excel. If I go to the next bit, but I'll write it out and I'll explain what I've just opened up on the screen there. So beds underscore data, control shift and M for the pipe, and then filter date equals in brackets, well, not brackets, they're quotation marks. <laughs> Not doing very well. 2018-09-01. And then if I do control and run, this is what you get. The date is this column that I'm referring to. And the date equals is a test of equality. So it's particular in um, the filter that you use double equals sign. If you did just one, which happens, I forget now, you get a bit more information in um, dplyr. So I'll just pull this down. There's a little bit here that sort of, it's a very common error. It's very easy to be typing out and forget. It's a test of equality, so it's a double equal sign and it will give you a little prompt. You do use single equal signs and we'll see that in a couple of other slides as we go ahead. I also think it's useful to know the not equals as much as the equals. So if you didn't want it, we're not going to do that in the context of our explanation, but if you wanted not equals, I want to exclude that particular quarter, you do an exclamation mark and an equal sign. Uh, it's not very clear on here because you just get the top 10, but you just, you don't, you won't, hopefully won't find 2018 September 2001. So I will copy that code. So you've got that one. Now, if we add those together, I'm going to put in the middle of this one here. Uh, a range is going to slip in between the filter and the object title. So a range descending, ooh, beds underscore AV. Thankfully, it found it. And then at the very end, it's very crucial to put the pipe. So it goes on to the next line. And if I run that, let's see. Oh, doesn't answer there. What we see are the beds in descending order but we've only got these dates here. So before, when we had Nottingham Health Healthcare, which was my trust, it was at the top if I did it by just arranging it. <clears throat> That's now second. Whereas I think it was top before because it was top in a different quarter. I'm getting too much into the data here rather than the code because my trust isn't in there. <laughs> Excuse me while I drink my coffee. Right, next question. 
which five organizations had the highest percentage bed occupancy in September 2018. As we did before, we'll break down the subject, the question. We're looking for the highest. We would think about a range for that, as we did before. The date, September 2018, which is the filter which we used. Uh, but we don't have this variable of percentage bed occupancy. and We don't even have it in the data. We've got averages, but we don't have percentages. But we can create it. And we would use it with the, the, one of the strange verbs, which I mentioned. So beds underscore data. And then control shift and M for the pipe. And then mutate which sounds a very strange verb. It's not something that necessarily equates. Could not find the, fun oh, Amanda's had a bit of an error, sorry. Um, I think if you, Amanda, are you on your computer again? So I can't remember if you're a computer or cloud. Cloud, have you tried the tidyverse again? It might be that you need to do library tidyverse. I'll just put that into the chat and try that because when it's saying it's not seeing that function, that's because it's not seeing that package, which I think gets, well, it will get loaded with tidyverse. So I'm hoping that that will solve it. And, and while that's happening, I'll just drink the rest of my coffee. I'm hoping that will help. But while you're looking at that, I will continue. So mutate in this context is in SQL for those users, it's changing your data set, your structure of your table. So it's it's more of a concept as opposed to a straightforward um, translation, one for one. You're creating a new column and changing your whole data table. If you're in Excel, it's, it's a bit easier really, you're just kind of adding to your table. But if you had made it a table using some of the wizards that are available in Excel, so it recognizes it as one, table when you've given it a table name, if you added it, it would be that kind of concept of changing your data table. I'm saying data table, but it's very, very different to data table, which is the package. Uh, so it gets very confusing in the tech, the, like the language. Um, so I will write this and, and it hopefully will become clear as I write it. So perk oc is a name. Just to make that clear, I'm going to put percentage occupancy. I'm calling this new column of data percentage occupancy. And then I'm going to write what I want it to be, which is a mathematical thing. So it's occupation underscore AV for average divided by beds underscore AV for beds average. Control and enter to return. And then we get this information here. Oh, no, you can't see it because my screen's all squished. Nope, still squished. Keep going. There we go, percentage occupancy. Hopefully you will see that on your screen. So this is the name of the column I've created and I called it percentage underscore occupancy. This code and I'll share it in the, um, in the chat. Oh, my screen's about to die. My computer, sorry, not my screen. Um, yes, here on the slide, I called it perk underscore oc. You can call it anything you like. You could call it X or Y, but they're not very meaningful names. And we will talk about naming in a few slides. If you forget, because this is a single equals and you do double equals, you just get a kind of like a pointer and it's an error, but a bit more information with that error rather than some of the errors which are quite standard and other bits of uh, R programming, which are really impenetrable and very difficult to kind of work out. This is quite common. And so what they've done is sort of hard coded their error help file. So it's just kind of, I see that and think, oh, yep, yeah, I've got two equals, try it with one. Yeah, that works better. Okay, I think I'm just going to pause for a second because Amanda's had a, a bit of a, a... So we're looking at mutate and we're creating a new column, which is percentage underscore occupancy equals, and then we're doing a mathematical sum here, which is taking this column occupancy underscore average and dividing it by beds underscore average to get the percentage occupancy average. I've just called it a bit longer percentage because I can do, just to refresh on that. It is not a test of equality in big letters, but don't worry if you get the wrong equals in the wrong bit, it will give you a little warning and a bit of a prompt as to what to do and to consider. 
When we combine them all together, which is the idea of taking very simple steps with a simple verb function, simple steps, but we're solving a complex problem. We had one question, but it had three factors to it. One, creating something that didn't exist. Two, filtering by date. And then three, arranging in a particular order. So I'm going to write this out and then copy it into the chat after I've explained it. So this combines the three verbs and functions that we've just referred to. Beds underscore data is the object. Control, shift, and M for mic, which is the pipe. And then mutate with that the last bit that we covered, which is, I'm now going to call it perk oc, which is the name of the column that I'm call, you know, creating. Oops, underscore AV divided by beds underscore AV. And just so that I can show you as we go along, each step can be run in, you know, as you write it, run it, does it work, keep going. Is there a way of seeing the newly created variable in the data set tab? Up here, not yet. Uh, because I've been creating it and I haven't created the objects. So I haven't made it go over here so I can just click on it and open it. So Nick, your answer to, in answer to that question, no, not yet, but we will do in a second. Well, not a second, in another section. Control shift and M for the pipe. And this is where we want to filter all this data because we don't want 2013. We want date equals test of the quality. So two equals. And then in quotation marks, 0901 for 1st of September quarter. If I run that, I now get this date. So I've combined creating this column, perk, oc, on this occasion, with the data table. So unlike before where it was in this area here as a view, so I can't pop it out. It's, it's all, it's just the first 10. So I can't see all of these other 197 more rows but we will get to where you can. Get to the end of that line, control shift and M for pipe, another one, because we're going into the next line. And this is where I put in the ordering function, which is arrange. I want it in descending order because I want the greatest at the top. And I want perk oc, which is my new column that I've created to be the thing that I filter, not filter, order by. On. So you can see it's changed its order. And I will just share that in the chat. So we created a, uh, created a column, filtered by the date, and arranged by the new column. The next question, if anyone has any of their own questions, that's fine. Does filter have to come before arrange or does it not matter? Try it, uh, range. I think it doesn't matter actually. If you think about it logically, I will just do that. I will put the filter afterwards. You get the same answer because if you think about it step by step, all I've done, all I've done here in this context is I've created my column, arranged it, and then discarded quite a lot of it. Whereas the original way was discard a lot of it and then filter, no, what did I do? I filtered first and then discarded. I think maybe computationally, the first way is faster if you've got like thousands or millions, no, not thousands, <laughs> a big number these days is it? Millions of rows. It's better to short, shorten it down, bring it down to the smallest possible, but it doesn't mean that you don't get the same output. It just means that it might be a bit slower to run. Nice question. Um, yeah, I'm getting some great questions overall, I must say here. So thank you, everyone. Next question is, what was the mean number of beds across all trusts for each value of date? Now, this is just after lunch. So if you're anything like me, you'd be like, where do we even start with this question? Mean, mean number of beds. We need to create a statistics from this. We need to find the mean. It's not in the data set. Oh, I just, just realized here and just to highlight, this is interesting where you've got 100% occupancy in, a, in Royal Free London and 100% in Oxleys. They're different types of 100%. Royal Free London has two beds of 100% occupancy, whereas Oxleys had 384 beds. So it's nice to have the two things there together where you've got your percentage and your number. I like that bit. Back to mean number of beds. We've got beds, but we don't have mean information in there. 
but we can use a statistic. So it's a bit of an extension of mutate. So mutate changes your table, your data frame, your tibble, and then you add your statistics into it line by line. Summarize is different. It takes your data and it creates a summary statistic, which can be really useful, but it does mean that it removes all the other stuff that you've got. And I will just write it out because that will be the easiest way of showing you. Beds underscore data, control shift and M for pipe, and then summarize. I'm using it with the S, but you can use Z in the spelling. Beds, mean underscore beds is my name for it. And then I'm going to write mean beds a, oh, I skipped it, a v. And I will share that code here. So the things to point out here is that you just get one thing returned, one of one. It does say na as well, which is what was expected. And I will explain that. But instead of adding, as it did in the previous way, a column that then added a statistical thing, uh, an equation way of looking at your data. Uh, you've just got one return thing, which can be quite useful at times, depending on what it is you're doing. So it's quite useful to combine both of them. But if you use a summarized burst, it squashes everything down. Um, it's not, yeah, I'm just thinking about in SQL. I, I don't know, you could get it in SQL. I'm just thinking about that one. NA is important in here. It's coming out as NA. We know we've got numbers in here, lots of numbers in beds AV. We should have a number here. But as soon as you have NA, which is non-applicable, which is like null in SQL, it, you can't do a mean on a nothing. So it comes out like NA. And you can filter out your NAs, but it's also part, it's a possibility of being part of your function. If I do beds underscore data, Control shift and M for pipe. Writing summarize mean underscore beds equals. So this is all the bit that we did before mean beds AV. But after the AV, I'm going by the uh, brackets on there. Brackets are very key. When I did return, it indented to here. So that's about right. I want it in my mean. I want NA.RM equals true. Now, what I'm saying there is default is false all your NAs remain in your statistic. But on this, I'm saying I want them removed. So I don't have to type very much into the code to remove that NA. And now I've got one summary statistic, which is what were the mean beds for the whole time period for all of the trusts? What mean number of beds do we have? And the answer is 300. I've also put in here that you can write just T so it's quite a lot of flexibility. It gets the same result, but it's just quite, it's a bit clear if you write true in the full context. I've also got to point out, and I didn't do that in the slide. If you do true, it doesn't change color because that true I've written is lowercase. It has to be all capitals. If it's a capital T and smaller, it doesn't recognize it because of that pedancy that our programming has about being in, in case sensitivity. So I've squashed my whole data set into one number. It's not very really meaningful, actually, if you think about it. Mean number of beds over a number of years. <clears throat> it doesn't really make much sense. But what we do then want to do is find out what the mean number of beds for tr all trusts for each date value. It's a bit more meaningful. We now know how to create the mean number using that summarize verb. For each value of date, we can then, we need to produce it that for each date. And that's the bit that we haven't covered yet. That's going to require a new verb. And when we use that one, it's called group by, which is distinctly different in my head to SQL. And it causes, it caused me a bit of um, confusion because of the kind of like the concept is very different. So if I write out the object, beds underscore data, control shift and M for pipe, and then group by. If I just do this first to show you what happens, group by date, and I'll just show you the original, there's no difference between the two. Now, when you're looking at your um, 
when you're using group by within a SQL context, you not only have to say exactly everything, because this is just one column, you need it by all of your columns. And what you're doing is you're shrinking it down just to the unique, in a sense, or distinct. But this is not doing it unless you're using having afterwards, but we're getting into the realms of a bit more um, SQL uh, context. What I've done here is just apply a kind of grouping metadata to the table. I've said I want to do something following this, but just for dates. So I want you to see all of these dates as one, and then these are a different date, and they're all together like sets in mathematical terms. Whatever we do next is going to be applied to those groups of data. And in this context, it's dates. So when we do our summarize, as it did before, it squashed the entire data set to one number. When we write it now, summarize mean beds equals mean beds underscore AV, which is the column name. And then I'm going to get rid of the, uh, if I can do it, true. All the RM, the remove the NAs, the missing ones. I now get each quarter's summary mean statistic because I've applied the mean summary uh, equation to the whole group of the dates within there. So that's all the trusts in September 2013. All of those, what's the mean number? And it varies over time, which is what I'd kind of expect. Is that okay? Because these are two slightly different things in terms of how we deal with data between, say, SQL and Excel. This is something, this would be like pivoting. But um, <clears throat> applying, I, don't, I can't remember now how to do pivots very well. The last part, I get NA for all the dates. You need to put in this particular section, which is NA. Oh, I'll just share the whole code. That might be easier. Oh, somebody else has done it. Hang on. Oh, is that? It's not working. Oh, you've spelled it's. Um, sorry, you got a spelling mistake in your NA. It's. It should be na.rm for Mike for remove. So it's a slip of the keyboard. Um, was the data already divided into quarters? Yes, it was. It was uh, kind of like taken to the first date of the quarter. Yes. So that's why we're only working by quarters. The changes occur. Sorry, it's still too tiny to read. Well, on this, this bit here in the console is too small here where my mouse, oh, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. I'm trying to work out which bit to increase in size. Is it this bit here, if I highlight it? I'm not getting any feedback, sorry. I'm not sure which one's too small. It might be, if it's the screen, don't worry about the, the presentation slides. Uh, I'm, what I really want you to see is the code that I've written and the output on the left. I don't know how to make this one bigger. Oh, I'm sure there's a way on the screen thinking about it, but there we go. No, it's not doing it. So just to talk about group by a bit more, because it's it's quite a, yeah, I'll make that too small now if I move that. Group by is um, often just used on its own in SQL and then you don't refer to it again, but because this is grouping in a kind of metadata way, so I'm applying this grouping sort of in to my table that you can't see a change in the data itself. It does mean it gets retained over the course of you adding other functions in there. And whilst you group by, sometimes some of the functions do ungroup by, but I'd say it's probably best to actually ungroup yourself just to make sure, um, belt and braces as it's also known as, just in case, because it can affect your data as you're going along and you can get some very strange results. Because if you group by your dates and do things, and then later on you're doing stuff with the, say the organizations, it's retaining that group by the dates and it can make it go all a bit funny. The funny thing with this, if I just write it all out, is you don't see any difference in your structure of your data. 
So beds underscore data and then the pipe control shift and M group by date control shift and N for pipe again. Summarize. I'm just repeating what I wrote before. Bed so that's the name of the summary statistic I'm creating. Mean beds underscore AV N A dot R M equals true. You can see the data there, which is what I did before. But if I do this control shift and M for a pipe and then ungroup and then run that, you get the same data. But I've removed this grouping that's applied on top. I'll make this a bit bigger. Let's see the parents. <clears throat> So you don't see anything in your data here, but it's a nice warning just in case you're working away and you get something funny, just check that you haven't ungrouped it. So it's good to use them always together. The next question, hopefully that can be seen okay. I couldn't make it necessarily bigger, I'm not sure, on that screen. Working with multiple screens can be quite tricky. <laughs> Which five organizations have the highest mean percentage bed occupancy over the five year period, which is what we're covering with this data. <clears throat> now I'm going to ask you to have a bit of a go with this and I'll be available to ask questions or just, just having a go will really help consolidate some of this thing that you've just like thrown at you really rapidly within this course. Um, what I want you to do is to create bed percentage bed occupancy, which is the new variable, which is when we use mutate as a hint. Then for each of the organizations, so on this occasion is organizations, not date, using group by, so we're bucketing them into sets. <laughs> and then we're going to use a diff, uh, no, the same summary statistic that we did before, which is the mean for the mean um, percentage bed occupancy. So you're applying that mean statistic on the variable that you created in the first step. And then we're going to order it to find the highest using a range. I'm going to let you have a go at this. I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to say five minutes in the initial time and then see how people get on. It, it can be longer, that's fine. And I will give you a hint here, which has all of the, hopefully you can see that. Let me get it a bit bigger. Because the more I move that and give it space, the bigger it gets. I'll put that in the um, chat as well, just to have a go at trying to create a column with a statistic, then grouping it, and then summarizing it, squashing it down to another statistic, and then arranging those statistics. And in the meantime, I'm going to just go off mic. I'm going to be here and just going to cough a bit which can be very irritating through the microphone. And please do let me know if that's still tiny, which bit of the screen is still tiny and I can try and tweak it to make it bigger. Thanks. Okay, for this next session, we're going to look at naming objects, which is various things, actually. There's a, a lot of naming goes on in this. So we'll revisit our dplyr session. We're actually still in it, to be honest. Um, we did some code here, which is looking at summarizing by mean beds. I'll pop that into the chat so everybody can see that code. It should be familiar by now. Uh, it's got the object, beds data, pipes, grouping by the date, which just changes your group structure, but doesn't change your data itself. Summarizing to mean beds and making sure that you've got na.rm equals true. So you remove your nulls just in case. I don't think it affects this in this context, but it's just in case. You get this data underneath. And if we wanted to visualize, so that's actually going back to the ggplot2. When we put in the first bit before in the ggplot, we would say data equals. Now the data equals can be something like this of three lines of code. You can take your dplyr code and then pop it into ggplot2. I'm just going to copy all of this. I'll share it in the chat so you can do the same. 
and I can drop it in there and use it in the, well, you should have it in both contexts, actually, I, I suppose. You can use it in any script. You can plot it. It doesn't look great in the plot. Um, just making sure I'm sharing my screen. Uh, it doesn't look great in the plot, but that's what you can do. That's data equals. If I write data equals, it's just a bit more pedantic. It's just explaining what it is. It's often better, I've just skipped over that a bit quickly, sorry. It's often better to keep your data manipulation separate because to your to your, uh, ggplot2, but that's, it's down to preference really. Oh, I didn't share the code. Try that, that would be better. It just makes it sometimes a bit easier to debug. So when you have a problem, you, you then know whether it's your chart code or the debug, the, um, the manipulation code. But if you want to put both together, that's fine. It can get quite long winded within your data part here. So you might have like lines upon lines upon lines of code, which makes it a bit unwieldy. So that's not the best thing to do to keep it together, like nesting one inside the other, like a formula an if statement where you've got ifs inside ifs and things like this or subqueries inside of queries it's better to make always go for the most readable code as possible so if it means that you do step by step by step that's actually really good practice and it helps you and it probably helps other people when they're also reading it but this really is a whole chunk of data this is a data frame isn't it this is a table on its own we've just created it with code just like on the fly, but we might want to use it repeatedly in different contexts, either to do more data manipulation with it or visualize it as we're doing in this context. So we can give it a name. And uh, this is the code which I'm, I've blocked out. But if I, if I take, what am I doing? If I copy the code here into my data. So this is my data that I'm just running. So it comes down here into the console with the two columns and if I wanted it to appear up here into the environment the top right hand part of the our studio I'll give it a name I'll just call it beds underscore ts for time series and then this strange key which is an arrow to the left and a hyphen and then do control and enter and now in the console instead of showing you the data it shows the code I've used and up here which is a bit squashed in the environment, I can now see this new data, which is beds underscore TS. If you click on that, it answers a previous question in the chat. You can now see it as if it's an object. It is an object, sorry, as if it were the same object as you had before when you imported some data. So you can do with that as you did before, which is pop it out, use it, filter by it, order it within that view. I will explain what that symbol is in a second, but the other nice thing about, oh, no, I, I will explain it now, I think is the point. This can equally be an equals, you get the same thing, but there's a bit of a tradition within our programming that it's the arrow and the hyphen. That key used to exist. This is a story I think I've heard and I haven't researched it, but I guess this is true. It was on people's keyboards when they first used the precursor language, which was S, then it became R. So S was the proprietary software and then R was the free. And I think at that time, those keyboards had this key, which is um, an arrow to the left and a hyphen. You can do a shortcut, which is, and I will have it on a later slide, which is, let me just write above here in a thing, Alt and the minus key at the top of your thing. So if you do Alt and minus, it then formats it as well with the spaces wherever you are in your line. <coughs> There we go. There, there it is. Alt and minus to get that shortcut key. Whereas equals just does equals, which you'd have to then format it yourself. You can use equals. It's just I think people like to see this because then they feel like it's a proper R thing, but you can work between them. I think the equals might be maybe I mean, I'm making excuses now. It may be confusing with the use within dplyr or other service, other packages where you're saying equality or this becomes like as in SQL. Uh, I think that's just an excuse. I'm just making it as an excuse. Object names, when we're naming things like this beds underscore TS, the previous ones that we, when we imported them, our studio took, or, or, or the package, sorry, Redar, took the name of the file and made that the object name. But when we're creating the objects ourselves, we need to come up with a, the name. 
and it has to be descriptive. So X is not very descriptive and Y is not very, you know, what, what is X? It needs to be shortish. X is probably too short. You don't want it too long, like it's got some sort of paragraph to it. And I think the thing that's key is consistency with other names. <clears throat> the code creates, uh, yes, I've, I've kind of jumped ahead. So the code, this slide is just saying how it appears up here as an object and you can then deal with it. You can use it as if it was an object, kind of like temporary tables or on a, a separate tab if you're on Excel, it's kind of that concept. So if we return to this plot, which I've got up here, where I've got my data equals and then I've got all that code in there. It's quite long code to maintain and to debug, but now I've created my object. I can delete all of that and say equals beds underscore TS. And it will then do that chart, which is the same as I've done before. So you can't see the difference, but it just means that I don't have this code here. Just to be aware, like in many things in scripting, it's good to have the order in place. So you need to create the object first of all, and then refer to it. That's the thing about using script and bouncing around, which is what I've done. Try and keep that logical order. And it makes it much easier and neater. That seems reasonably okay, but if anybody has any questions or you might be starting to think about other things a bit further along, like, Oh, this is a chance to do it yourself, actually. I'll do that one first. I'll put this into the code. So you can have a quick go with that key, the, um, the alt and minus. Do you need to save that object in files as well? That's an excellent question. And you can export it to CSV. That's one way of doing it. But what I do is I just use my scripts to generate the code each time. So when I have um, a script or an R markdown script, which I will cover in a second, that code, so if I just loaded that code, so uh, where are we? That was the loading code. And then if I created the file underneath, I'll just do this as a new one. So it's clear, oops, it would help if I did it. I forgot I was in the cloud. So this is what I would probably do. That's my package. That's the code, the, the data I want to load. And then at the very end, I want to create this. And that would be my script. So I don't need to save the object anywhere because I am generating each time I have that script open. And then if I pass that on to a colleague, they don't have to have my data set saved anywhere. They just need to use the sort of like generic data set that we have between us, say. But you can save it, and there are packages to save to CSV and Excel. Um, have a go with that question that the code that I put in there just to give it a name and then try and run it and I will explain you might see that it's a bit different depending on how you try to open it a plot opens and shows different information to your table so don't worry too much if it doesn't look quite what you expect it to part of this exercise is to practice using that shortcut key giving it a name and then seeing something float up here into the environment so that you have a go with that. Just give you a minute or so. Oh, smiley face. You could do a little smiley face if you've done that or just want to move on. There are no smiley faces, but I'm hoping that people have had a go. I'm going to just kind of rush on because I'm a bit conscious of the time and 
and the change of clocks and things that we've had. So don't worry too much if you haven't quite understood uh, like where bits are, if you're halfway through, I'm just gonna talk through and you can follow the bits that I'm gonna do. So what I was looking for was either, I guess you could do this where you do plot equals, that will work. Having a go with that symbol, alt and minus are the shortcut keys I use a lot that will also do the very same thing. And what you'll see up here in the corner is the plot in the environment. So under the three tables that you've got, which says objects next to it, the plot says list of nine. To run the plot, that can be the tricky bit really. Um, if you click on it here in from the environment, you get something that doesn't look like a plot. It's a lot of information behind it. It's about how it was created, where the data comes from, what the layers are. There's a lot of information in there that I don't really know how to break into. Oh, that tells you the data and things. That's not quite what you were looking for, I guess. So I'll just get rid of all of that so you can see it when it flashes up. So if you put plot into the script and then just run it from there, like I have been doing for some of the um, tables, it pops it as a plot. So it's reading it to throw it into the corner. Those slides don't necessarily explain that particularly with plots, but it's just to show that it, this is what the list is. When I said earlier, when I was talking about the concept, I used the word list, but really this is a concept and the two things clash. So the key points of this is this is how you use the uh, the arrow and minus key, which is the or hyphen. I suppose it's a yeah, it's both, isn't it? It's a minus and a hyphen that helps you name the object. It tells it what to name. And then when you want to view the plot, if you just run it as code itself, <coughs> that's how you see your plot. Naming styles. Now in a lot of the things that we've used here, we've used lots of underscores and I've listed out here in this particular slide, I'll make it bigger, are just the four different ways of how things are written out to make it readable or accessible. And I think the thing here is about consistency. So if you use one, try to stick to it. There's a bit of, bit of an exception there for our markdown, but I'll run through each section. Camel case, um, it, I'd never seen, I'd not seen this kind of format before R or because I hadn't really done anything other than SQL. So camel case starts off with small letters at the beginning and then the first word afterwards and subsequent have capitalization afterwards. So if it said camel case load, the load would have a capital L and it kind of makes those bumps along, which feels a bit strange because camel has a small and case has an upper, which is when Pascal case comes into it where people quite much prefer that. So it's a bit like hashtags in certain things that makes it quite readable where you've got a mixed case with kind of like usual recognizable English where you have, I suppose in, in another languages too, where each word has a capital it just kind of separates your words even though they're all squashed together because there's nothing between them. Snake case is all lowercase and as you could see when we just brought those CSV files in it defaulted to that. Each space is filled in with an, uh, an underscore which is quite used that you see that a lot in R. And kebab case is an interesting one where they're, they're all lowercase but they are separated by a hyphen or minus key between them. And that's used in R Markdown a lot. It will fail in R scripts. It's just that you'll start to see that when you use R Markdown. I didn't realize when I first got into this that they each had a name as well. And it's fascinating what they get called. Oops. So the next section is relational data, which I think will be quite familiar for those who use SQL, but there are a few concepts in here that are new in terms of joins and could be quite new for other individuals. Hi, Helen, you're back. Is everything okay? Hopefully, this this is a good part to come back. I got you on mute, but I'm, I'm happy to see you back. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's all working. Thank now. you. Well, we're just starting a new section, so this is an excellent time to come in. I've covered okay. a few other bits and I'll be recording those bits separately because I wasn't recording very well, but it's easy to catch okay. up on those bits. But the relational data bit, it's a good one to come into. So as I was saying, people who use SQL will be familiar with some of these. There's a couple of extra concepts which don't, they exist in SQL, but not as joins. 
And for those individuals who are used to other areas, uh, say like other programs, I should say, it, it can, this is stretching it a bit because I think Excel, you use VLOOKUPs, HLOOKUPs, um, char index and match. And this is probably a little bit further along in that concept, but these are really powerful things to do with your data. What, oh, let me see. Yes, yeah, sorry, I missed the screen. So we've been working with just individual data sets, just one flat data set and, di and, and CSV file. But often you get into this point where you want to combine data together, sometimes quite quickly. And if you're familiar with analysis in the NHS and in social care and other areas, pretty quickly you'll be joining data together because they're kept in different files and different structures. I will close that. So one of the very common joins that we do quite early on is called a left join. And this is a nice representation of it that's a graphical thing. I think I got this from somebody's, I should really reference it thinking about it, it's excellent. It's a GIF that people have produced and I think they used R to produce that GIF, um, GIFI or GIF. So it's moving in this context of the left hand of your side of your data has one, two and three. And what gets retained from the right is what matches. So four, gets dropped because it doesn't match the left. That's what VLOOKUP does, and it's also left join in SQL. So people are quite familiar with that, but the code is here, and I will go through an example where we show it. So it's slightly different in the look to people who've written out SQL, but we'll go through that when we've actually got the actual data into the, into the system. And because it's best, the best way to learn is by doing, and look at the next slide is the bit that I didn't anticipate, which I should have done, which is to import three files called tb underscore cases.csv, tb underscore pop.csv, and tb underscore new underscore table.csv. Now I'm going to do that and I'm going to do it rapidly. I'm just going to click on the files themselves, import data set. I'll make it big actually. Make it big, 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 big. So I'm clicking on tb underscore cases.csv in the file list in the bottom right hand, import data set. You don't need to do any tidying for this, they're all tidied. And I'm just going to do the import button. Whereas before we said, don't do that, just copy it and paste it. I'm just going to cop, just import. And there you go, you can see it, it actually just checks that library readar is done and then it imports and then it views it. And then you can see it as an open view, which is fine. Next one I'm going to do is in this list because it's now tv underscore new underscore table. I'm going to do that one and just import. And then I'm going to do tb underscore pop.csv import even before it's loaded. And then I've imported them all. I'll give you a couple of seconds so that everybody else is there with me. If you are not seeing the same things, please do let me know and I can try and bring it up. What you'll see are these three new tabs if you've done what I did. And then you'll see three new objects here. Great. I'm going to open up a new script. Feel free to put this code wherever you want. Just out of good practice, I'm going to write tidyverse at the top. I don't need to run it again. It's just that if you're sharing your scripts, it's just really good to put it right at the top to say all the different libraries that you're using so that it, you know, it's just a reminder for the future and also that it does load it the next time you use it. So there's a, a lot of squeezing in here. Squeeze that over there. Try doing that, give that a bit more space. Right, left join. I'm going to join tb underscore cases with um, tb underscore pop. So I'm gonna do control shift and M for the pipe so that you recognize that from the other work that we did with dplyr. This is a dplyr join because you can see there it says dplyr, I mean function, left join, which is the same name as SQL, which is nice. And then I'm just going to write TB pop. It recognizes it, fills it in. And then I'm going to write by equals and in quotation marks, which is quite key, country, control and return. And then you get this information below. There's a couple of things to point out from that data, as you can see. Um, you'll probably see those duplicates. Now there's duplicates on the columns dot y 
year dot y, year dot year dot x and year dot y. There's also duplication on the countries themselves. So we have four for Afghanistan and four for Brazil, and then it continues, no doubt, on the others. And year dot x is repeated. That's for those who are familiar with joins, that's because the join on the left is joining to multiple um, re records through the country on the right. So 1999 is joining to all of the other four that are available through the population data because we're matching on the country alone. <clears throat> to get around that, we need to join by country and year. So I'm going to write this out again so that you can just see this. So TB cases, control shift M. Did I share it before? Possibly not. No, I didn't. I'll just share that code so you've got that in there. Left join, uh, TB pop, and I'm going to do by equals. So it's it, slightly different to SQL because you'd say on and detail everything. And this is just in that C that you'll recall, hopefully, I've written country in quotation marks and year in quotation marks. So when I do control and enter, ooh, you get a lot of information there. So I will just share that in the chat. And then it says a reminder about recalling the C for concatenate because these are saying multiple column names. And that's when that C comes into its own in the context of joins. So when I was using it before in dplyr, <coughs> It was as an in, so match these with one, match these multiple things in that column. This is matching multiple columns in a join. And that's just a, a reference to the dates and the, um, the text. Oops, it's a return. <coughs> now, this is why I particularly like Excel, uh, Excel dplyr, Excel, it's the wrong course. Um, TB cases, control shift and M, left join, and I'm going, this is kind of like the lazy, probably expectation thing, let's see what joins, I'm just putting in here, just the name of the other table. So if I didn't know two tables, I've not done this necessarily, where I've gone left join table X with Y, let's just see what joins. Um, and see how lucky I can be. Or if I knew that they actually did match, I do on this occasion, I do know that these two match on the names of the columns. But what's nice is you get the code up here in this section. So as you've done in many, many other parts of our studio, there's always corresponding code. So when dplyr or ggplot2 does something for you, um, particularly in dplyr, it, they tell you the code. In ggplot2, they give you warnings about what statistical tests are being applied, for example, or what default there is. So I, I have done this where I've copied it and pasted it. So there you go, it matches the one above. So that's quite nice. It doesn't work, though, if you have a file, if you have two tables that don't have matching column names. Now, the matching has to be precise on the case as well. Case sensitivity is, is crucial. So if I do TB cases, Control shift and M for the pipe and then do left join again, but do TB underscore new underscore table just as an example and run that. There are no joins because there are no corresponding column names between them. I have to stipulate them because they're slightly different in the, the tables. I'm going to do by equals C again, that concatenate, but it's slightly different in this. I'm just going to bring it onto the next line so it's got a bit more space. So the C is not as it was before, where I had country and then a comma and then something else. I actually need to say country equals place. So if I show you, if I just show you on the new table, there's place and year, year, without the, uh, the things, um, and cases is country and year. So in this code, I need to say what it is on the left on the column equals the thing on the right. Now, country equals place. And I know that so they just got different names. So I've written that in there. And I know that I'm just making lots of assumptions quickly. Year equals year. And then you get that match because those two things match. 
equals here is key. If you're just doing completely, you know that they match, but they're two separate ones, it's a comma. So they're very distinct. You also have to get them in the right order. I will just show you for the purposes of this, because this caught me out so many times. Left has to be left. If you do it the other way, it it's, gets very upset and you get an error. They both exist, but they're in the wrong side. It has to correspond with position as well. So that's very key. Now there are other joins. So anything that's in SQL, <coughs> so you've got inner join, full join, right join, they all exist in dplyr. But I'm going to now show you a couple of joins, which I said conceptually you can do in SQL, but they're slightly different code. It's not a join in SQL, but they are very powerful, very useful for data manipulation in R. So the first one, I could sort of give you a quick preview and then went off it really quickly, was something called semi-join. So for those who are Excel uh, SQL people, it's equivalent to exists. I don't think this even exists in Excel. I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not that advanced in Excel these days, so I'm not sure about this. And what this is doing, if I explain the GIF that's on the screen, is I'm taking everything on this semi-join, oh, sorry, the semi-join, everything on the left that matches the right, but drop anything that doesn't match. So unlike with the left join, I would retain that number three. In this occasion, I'm, I'm not, I'm getting rid of three and I'm getting rid of four because they don't match between them. So it's a little bit like an inner join, but there's a slight difference of it. Now it's just made me pause to think about that because that does look like an inner join, doesn't it? Hmm, that's got me thinking. I'm not sure about that. I'm gonna go into the example to kind of explain it. Oh, that's why it's not an inner join. Just remembered. It's not bringing anything back from the second table. That's why it's different. I'll get there in the end. I've also got that kind of like end of day thing going on. I'm getting everything back in the left that matches the right, but none of the right data. It's not quite clear on that. It should have like an extra tape, an extra column or something. It just drops it all. I don't bring any of it back. And the use case, which put it into perspective for me, is a really useful use case that somebody gave me in the training course, which is, you know, why you lot can, you lot, people can contribute to what we do. So, because it's a community, we all bring our skills and expertise and experiences. And this came from, um, as I say, a colleague, which is fantastic. When we're looking for hospital patients who have had a COVID test, we just want to know that they've had that. We don't want the test results. So we don't want anything about the test. And that's when a semi-join can come into its own, which is where it exists is in SQL. So if I just write this out, the example, to try and explain it using these tables that we have with us here. So TB underscore cases, um, and then control shift and M for pipe. Semi-join fills it in. I'm gonna to join to the TB new, K, new table. And what I'm also going to do in here, which is a, uh, a little bit in, in advanced, I suppose, uh, which is good, is create another col another, it's like a sub query within a query if you're a SQL person, or it's like creating another table on another tab that you refer to in Excel. So I'm going to write filter, I'm filtering my new table by first letter, I use Pascal there, equals A. So if I just highlight this, so I'm just highlighting the inner bit to show that you can just highlight bits of your code, control and enter and run that with the bracket. You can see what I'm doing. I've, I've kind of, I've taken the data set and I've reduced it to A as the letter, first letter. And that's part of my semi-join. But because the semi-join table, the two tables that I'm using don't have corresponding um, column names, they don't match, I need to say what I'm joining it by. So by equals C, back to that thing again where I said country <coughs> equals place. And then year equals year. And I'll share that code with you. My table on the left are the cases. My table on the right 
really just had first letters of the um, names and I've brought nothing back from that other than well nothing from the table itself but I have brought back anything where I said the first letter equals a I've also slipped in the using um, a semi a join and creating another table within a join a table within a table I'm assuming everything's okay with people, but please do say at any point. If you've got any more use cases, I'll be good as well, because I was like that. The next one I've really um, been quite taken with in R, and I think this would be not exists, I think, in SQL, is an anti-join. So as before, I was looking for anything on the left that matched the right, but don't bring anything from it, just to sort of get the information that I can. If I want to exclude, so always the negative to kind of complement the positive, in this uh, GIFI that's on, on the screen, we've got, or GIF, we've got one, two, and three on the left side, and one, two, and four on the right. So three does not match the right side. It doesn't, one and two do match. Four on the right doesn't match the left, but we're not interested in that. We're looking for the three to stand out. And that's what we get back. We don't get back anything else. Not exists, really. I want to check that this number three, this is the only one I can see, does not exist on the right. A use case in this, a slightly different context, another colleague that I used to work with, unfortunately he's gone somewhere else, he's now, he did text mining, and this was quite a useful concept in text mining where you have stop words, which we use in English quite a lot, but and or, they're, they're sort of, not the filler words, but the ones that join our sentences together. We don't really want to count those, because if we do, they'll just overtake all the other words we have. So what we want to do is to, um, in the context of text mining, is exclude those, those stop words. We keep a list of what they are. I think the might even be in there as well. And then exclude them. We just want those words that don't match that. So that would be things like hospital, ward, um, food, uh, things like that. And the ones that we do match, we, we just ignore. They get dropped from your data set. So using our data set to sort of explain that a bit further, TB underscore cases again, control shift and M for the pipe, anti-join, and then TB new table. Again, what I'm going to do in there, instead of doing, um, I'm going to use the same uh, bit in size. So another control shift and M for the pipe, and then I'm going to filter again by first letter equals a so it's exactly the co same code as before only i'm doing an anti-join rather than a semi-join in fact i'm going to copy the by as well so I, I don't need to copy the type that out and read it out so it's exactly the same but instead of bringing back just the a letter the the countries that begin with the letter a i'm bringing back everything with a country doesn't match a And just to sort of reiterate that the amount of code that we use for this is very minimal and also quite, I'm thinking it's computationally a bit less intense because exists can be quite uh, slow sometimes. I don't quite understand how it works in SQL. I've tried using it a few times and I couldn't quite get it to work very well. So this is a nice way of using it. And that's the end of that session. Let's have a look at where we are on this. OK, what I propose is that we're, because it's getting quite close to, well, very close to four o'clock, I have a couple of sessions left. I won't do the SQL connections at the end because I don't think I can competently do it as well as my colleagues who created this just at the moment. Uh, but the data, the, the code is all available. And if you ever get stuck with your SQL connections and want to talk to people who know what you're talking about, come to the NHSR Slack group. What I will do next is do our markdown. I'll just have a quick break though, two minutes, um, and then go on to some other things for ongoing learning. And then I think we have, covered so much in one day and you've done so well so far to keep up with me so if I open up this bit um I will say come back at 3.43 I can't find the chat has anybody got any questions from the joins 
43. I'll pause. The next session, se session we'll cover is our markdown. And I, I never really feel like at the end of a very long day, which we're, we've really worked hard um, looking at visualizations and data manipulation, it all comes together in our markdown, but I don't always feel like I do it enough justice because it's a very, very powerful way of bringing together your data and your text and your code and also producing lots of other things. So this will be a taster and I would definitely recommend if you're not already on the workshop this week for, I think there's one this week for our markdown, then maybe future training sessions through NHSR community or look at some of the videos that are already on YouTube or will be after this workshop week because there's a lot to pick up and it's, it's a, a fantastic way of looking at a code. It has its own terminology and its own language, which I will go through, which makes it a little bit harder to teach really. But uh, what I did when I first started with R Markdown is use a lot of other people's code, which is wonderful that people share. First of all, and this is good recommendation for things like Shiny as well, if you ever get into that and want to use that, is to look at the templates within RStudio. So if you first of all go to File and New File and select R Markdown dot 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 on any, if you're on the cloud or your PC, that's fine. It will open up a, a wizard, first of all, and this gives you a, a kind of slight hint at the potential for our markdown. It gives you these options on the left, document, presentation, and shiny from template, and whether the output format is HTML, PDF, or Word. So it's already hinting at how flexible it is. I'm gonna recommend using HTML, and certainly for this particular thing that we're going to work through, because it's very accessible. PDF is not always so accessible, and Word, is accessible, but can be quite tricky to get the layouts right and things. And it's also not interactive, whereas HTML is. And some of the functionality of our markdown comes with it being interactive. I'm just going to write test in there and I'm going to write my name in the author. Um, and that is what appears at the top of the R markdown. If I scroll that across there so you can see it says this period bit here where it's separated by these three dashes at the top of the bottom is the YAML. Now I saw recently, somebody said it was yet another markup language. And then somebody said something that it isn't really that. I, these things kind of come into terminology and I'm not entirely sure where they come from or what the history is. But what our markdown is, is a markdown language, which is around R. So my introduction to markdown was through R. And other people may be familiar with it either through their own programming backgrounds or perhaps using um, note-taking apps, which I didn't know even existed, like Obsidian. They use um, Markdown. I can't think of anything else. I'm sure there's a Notion does it as well. I'm not very good at note-taking, but these are Markdown things. And so uh, quite a lot of what they use in those scripted, la the scripted languages come into play here as well. You can run the code to make it run itself, either by doing it in the in the console, but I'm just going to use this button here, which says knit, if you can see that, which is between a magnifying glass and like a cog at the top of the right hand part section of the um, the uh, screen, the R Studio called knit. And it's got a picture of a ball of wool with some knitting needles in it. And if you click knit, it then forces you, in a sense, to save it. So if I put test, because it needs to save it somewhere to build the files that relate to it. That's rapid, wow. And then it opens up in an HTML browser. Well, actually, yeah, in Chrome, because I'm in Chrome. But very, very quick. So if you're debugging or if you've got any issues at all with some code that you've got, maybe from somebody else or that you've built, if you start, and I've done this, I start with a clean template that you know runs like this does, and you can see if your code runs and what you can see if I put it side by side actually that makes it a bit easier it's very big that's because I made it big wasn't it I make it smaller I can never work out this shortcut there we go slightly smaller you can see the test name is here in the YAML Zoe Turner I put that there and also the date was automatic I think I didn't need to tell it that this bit output doesn't become part of your report this bit also doesn't come, become part of your report. This is uh, the setup section. 
about what it needs to do, whether it throws back your code so that you can see your code like here in this section or your warnings, what you do with it. And, and, and those kind of, I'll talk about those a bit more in some of the, the um, more complex reports. It combines text, which you can see all of this here, with outputs of code. Now it was using that cars data that's already built in. It also uses this particular template plot, which is a way of plotting your data in base R because it doesn't need any package installation. Um, although we went through ggplot2 today, this is using plot. Plot is very, very quick, but it doesn't have the same. You can do the same things as you can with plot, uh, ggplot2, but um, ggplot2 makes it a bit easier, you know, doing headers and colors and things like this. But it's a very fast, doesn't depend on any packages, way of running our markdown. There's a little bit of a hint here about what you can do in each of these, as they call them, chunks, whether you show the code or whether you don't. So up here, with the options set echoes equals true. <clears throat> That's a global setting where the, each chunk is saying, show the code, echo the code back out into the report. But this final bit down here is saying, and he, in this particular chunk, overwrite that and just show the plot. Don't show the code as well. If I just change that, and this is the thing, the other advice for this, if you can spell true, and then knit it again, is knit often and yeah, knit frequently and knit often. I think that's in the next slide. So here I've said false for the code being echoed or true, I should say. I overwrote the false and now I can see the code. Change the name. Um, oops. Let's change the name. This is my, bird. well, the title actually, not my name. Our markdown. And then it's so quick in this particular scenario, you can then see the changes. Oh, MIT. So that's the really basic um, template, which can be very useful to get started with your code structure. But there's a lot of potential which isn't actually even hinted at in this particular introduction sheet. So what I did, basing it on another, this one, this is about a more fancy, fantastic example, which I will show from Simon Wellesley Miller, who did talk at last year's, he, he presented this at, not this particular one I'm showing you, but the one I'm gonna show afterwards at the last NHS conference. Um, oh, excuse me. So he uh, showed a lot of potential and what you can do with it. And um, I, yeah, I don't, I'm just babbling now. So I'm just looking for my thing at the same time. So mine is here. Do you have to save the file to see it using not? Yes, you do have to, file, to save the file because as you can see um, more on this complex file here, it's created its own file structure and it also saves the HTML output somewhere. It needs to know where it goes. So you do have to save the corresponding thing and it, it forces you to do it. So there was my test.rmd and this is the test.html that's the output. So yes, you do have to save it somewhere. That's quite good reason to have a project so you know where it goes as well. So this is a, a more fancy, as I say, um, open that. And you should be able to run it from the cloud if you've got this. And if you've downloaded, you should be able to do it from your own PC and laptop. But I've just opened up something that I've already pre-run on the right so that you can see them side by side. And I have done this with Simon's code as well. And some of this code is from Simon's. I've gone through and I've copied it, the bits that I wanted and tried to break it apart, how it fits. And I would definitely recommend that if you've seen some of these R markdown that you quite like and you want to find out how they do bits, definitely um, steal bits of code. Let's try and get them side by side equally. So first of all, this YAML is a bit more detailed in this more detailed one, like a middle ground of R Markdown. The title is the same, but the date has within it an R bit of code. So it's it's separated with the back ticks. So the back tick is the key that's right next to number one. And that's used quite a lot in R to reference other files as opposed to within the code. So this is quite common using a back tick to denote that you're going to use some other code within this code. And we'll see some code, I think, actually within 
text, which is quite nice with our markdown. So instead of having it like this is text and this is code, you can actually combine the two within the same sentence, which is really powerful. The output here is HTML document, which was the same as previously, but I've got this one little line here saying code download equals yes, which is this little button in the top right of the final output where you can download the RMD file, which is the code script. So if you wanted to share your um, R Markdown report with a colleague who may be interested in this or you just have it in there anyway, just one line, one line of code means that they get both the report and they can download the uh, supporting RMD file behind it. HTML formats are very accessible, as I said, for people using screen readers. They're also accessible for people's, uh, I was just thinking their software on their computers. The thing that it's not very good with is Internet Explorer. And that does exist on quite a number of people's PCs in the NHS, which is a bit awkward because it does, we keep it because lots of um, legacy software runs on it but it does mean that things like our markdown doesn't run on it because they they tend to use the most recent um, browsers which are more secure so i would recommend using edge or chrome or firefox but it may be depending on your uh, user base who, who you're sending this to they may need some help to not go to the default if the default is internet explorer and save that file but it is an html file so it's it, it is easy to use it's just not everybody's that familiar with saving it and opening it again. Uh, what have I done here? That looks a bit weird. That looks very strange. Oh, that's why. Okay, TOC refers to table of contents, which is this thing on the left. And TOC depth is how many of the headers down that you want to include. So if this is down to four, and as I just scroll down and move this down, you can see it moves at the top, it sort of shows what you can see on the right. And TOC underscore float means it stays at the top. If I put false in, it would move down with it. And I think it knows. Yes, I think it stays at the top and you lose it when you scroll down. This is a bit more extended with that chunks set global, which we saw in the original, the default, the template, I should say. I'm switching off any messages and warnings and saying I don't want any code to come into my report because quite a lot of people don't want code showing in their final reports. Their final reports are kind of for a more general audience than a technical audience. It's good practice always to put your libraries at the top of your script. And in this regard, it's your R markdown. And then that advice that uh, came from Alison Hill, which who used to work for R Studio, and which was knit early and knit often. And I think that's really good advice. So it's good to see what you've written and what the output is and does it work. Our markdown is completely self-contained. It needs to have everything available to it. It does not use any of these things in the top right-hand corner in the environment, even though I've loaded it. I have to reference that code within my R markdown. It's self-contained. It needs to get the data in, it needs to manipulate it. So when um, previously we talked about saving an object file, and I said, I would write my code like this, where I'd have my library, and then I'd say where to get the data in, and then do the data manipulation in there to produce the object. That's what our markdown would need, or it would need it saved, and it would need a reference to it. <clears throat> OK, um, you can create new chunks uh, by doing the insert button, which is up here, which is kind of a green C, I think, chunk, you can actually select various languages to insert. So I have used SQL and you can use, uh, I'm just thinking, I'm not really sure about the others to be fair, I would use R and it, the, the way you can see it is because it says R in the curly brackets. So that's a way of creating a new one. Oh dear, lots of people having to leave at four. So that's okay. This is recorded so you can catch up later. And there also there are better and more wonderful workshops that you can catch up on about this particular session. So that's nice to have you, thank you. Um, where am I? So there are shortcut keys, I've struggled with them, but I've created my own shortcut key. And while we're here, I'll just show you that if you go to tools and keyboard shortcut help, there's a lot of shortcuts within R. But if you have a particular one that you favor from another program, you can overwrite those and create your own, which is nice. 
code chunks look like this, but they also have names in them, which don't come into the actual file, but it helps you localize, you find your chunks. And there are a couple of ways of navigating your chunks, which is one of them in the bottom right, where not by the console, but just above. If you click on where I've got something like the following section makes more sense in the code, lots of words, you can see all of the chunks and it says chunk names. And it's quite nice to name them. They will run without those names, but it just helps with navigation. And you can also see the headers as well. So that is a header, knit early, knit often, and you can navigate that way. Another area, to, another button to sort of navigate, to create a navigation system within our markdown when you're working is a, a list of lines. It looks like paragraphs, a, a particular, what's it called, like key, which is next to. I thought this was an A, but somebody actually pointed out their compass things which you can move not you can't move but that's what you should move so you can navigate this which is your uh, title headers or if this whole kind of look of code is a little bit overwhelming and our markdown and markdown and things if you click on that button which is the compass button which is relatively new um ooh, it makes it it changes the structure so it's slightly closer to the output. So you can see that this is a header and you can highlight and change your headers within this in a, in a much more familiar way if you're much more uh, comfortable with things like Microsoft products, which is very nice. So you can still see your code, but you have that greater familiarity when you're working with your text. <clears throat> so that's nice and you can see your chunks are a bit separated as well. None of these bits are coming out in the code because they're they're commented out, so they're not showing code. I've also set, set it so that it doesn't show code. And this is the load data, so I won't, wouldn't be able to do any plots without loading my data. And you're familiar with this because it's beds underscore data. Just quickly, I think, um, so that we can cover a few bits before the end of the session, just you've got the headers, that you can then change, you can make them vary in size. And actually in this particular compass visual view, you can see what the header, headers are. So in the code, they're just separated or differentiated, I should say, by hashes, how many hashes you have. The more hashes you have, the smaller the header. But you can see it here in the visual editor by just highlighting it, it goes down to four, and then you've got normal text at the bottom. You can do line breaks, this actually is a line break. I think there's code behind it, which you can see. And you can do lists and bullet points. And I think in this view, you can see them already, in a sense, they call it rendered. You can see what it would look like. I'm just gonna switch back to the code so that you can see the raw code. So it's very much like ggplot2 with coding your chart. So in Excel, it's click and drop, but our studio is allowing you within our markdown to mix the two when you're working with text. You can either have it looking like the output or you can refer to just coding it in a raw sense. So being specific about how to do italics and bold if that's what you want. Uh, you can also mix HTML with it. This particular chunk is HTML and what happens here is it creates a blue box. So it's very flexible with mixing your languages. This is a very end bit and I recommend looking at this and then just trying to run it line by line or chunk by chunk. If you're running your chunks, actually, uh, I should make that clear. If I go to the data, there's this is the data file. So I'm going to clear all of my objects. So all of the things that I've imported have gone. But when I go into my code here and run this chunk by using the little arrow to the right which is green saying run current chunk it will run that bit and then create the object in the top right hand corner which is the environment which is what we're familiar with there are other functions within, within this that you can it's just a, a nice way of seeing it rather than the code visually looking at whether you run things. I've actually just run by accident everything prior to it because it says run all the chunks above. And you can then also set in this bit, the name, the warnings, messages, switch them on or switch them off. So you can toggle things and it changes the code in the code chunk as you can see on the 
left. So this is very visually friendly. And revert, let's do that. So I've loaded the bed data and you can also, just wondering what was pinging at me. And I'm gonna run these two bits here to get the plot and the plot appears in line, so it's in my report. So I'm, I've not run the, inter well, I have by accident, but you can run individual chunks within your code. So long as they fall in that, lo that logical order, get your data in, do something with it and do your chart. When I first did this course, um, they suggested that if you write more text than code, then consider using our markdown. But if you're writing more code than text, use a script. I think as time's gone on for me, I've ended up using R Markdown so much, I've decided it's usually best to start with R Markdown because I, I tend to write lots of notes and it's really nice to write lots of notes as if it's a report itself. I'm taking this data from here and this is the problem I found with it and this is how I've cleaned it up. If you do that all in commented out chunks, it can, it can look a bit cluttered, but when it is the report, it doesn't feel so cluttered. But that's my own preference and I've kind of worked it over time. Um, <clears throat> the nice thing about this is that you can also run it within chunk by chunk so you don't have fear or worry about running things above it by accident or well and not that that's a big issue but it does mean that you can sort of logically place your code separately to each other for example. So I can have this about the beds data and the next section might be about something else. I'm just thinking, um, I've done a few things with the chunks here. So I've switched some of the sync things off and referred to previous ones, but um, I'm just going to whiz through, I think, uh, what's his face, um, Simon's quickly, because his is very impressive, just to give you an idea of all the possibilities. I'm not going to show you the code. I'd recommend seeing that code in the download or in your own or in the cloud. It's just taking a while to load because there's so much in here. So he has quite a comprehensive table of contents because there's a lot of examples of the different types of charts you can use and the different types of tables. He did giffies and pictures because you can really combine lots of information with it. Lots of text, as you can see, this looks very familiar. This is what I took for the like mid range example. And then this is where you get to the types of charts that you can look at. And the code be between these ones is really useful to see that they're not always very big, like just to code this bit that you'd expect to be quite a lot to say tab set as it's called. That's all it is, you write tab set in a particular place. It's very small amount of coding is required. There are lots of table formats you can use and this is a nice way of looking through and saying well I quite like that style and that's cable so I'll look at that package or I might like DT because it has this option of printing in different formats or I can do a search like this. Um, React table is a different one where you can extend on it and so they're very different types of packages and this is a nice showcase that Simon's done Oh, mind you, that's quite big, isn't it? <laughs> that's got all the data in it. He's used publicly available data through, I think it's the NHSR data sets he used for this. And he's also written out information on how to use things. Plotly is a very interactive chart, which I said that NHS Scotland use a lot and it's very powerful. And you can then see all these little tags on it. And I haven't really exploited it. It's full potential. You can do all of these things with zooming in as well. So I would recommend looking at that workshop that Annie's going to be doing later this week. Animation can also capture people's attention. This isn't a particularly great chart for animation, but it just shows you what is available. And the reason why it's all interactive is because it's through HTML R Markdown. Digraphs, you can zoom in on your chart. It's just another chart form. There are tree maps you can do. This doesn't show any particular data in a collapsible tree, but it just shows how lovely it looks. You don't need to code very much for this. It's already coded by somebody else in a package. <clears throat> you can mix your maps with your reports. And so I think this tells you teams. And you can untick the ones that you're not too keen on looking at today. Word cloud. Excuse me. Go 
compose myself. It was too exciting in the word cloud. So people quite like, uh, it's a very basic way of looking at text mining, I guess, <laughs> looking at how many, how many times the word is uh, referred to and then making that bigger. That is Alice in Wonderland and Alice is big, but said is marvelously big, which I hadn't realized. Pivot tables for people who are familiar and, and really like them in Excel. And also when you output things, you can also replicate that to some extent, I guess, within uh, packages within R. And so there's a lot in there and going through it step by step, I would recommend looking at the webinar, not yet, the, the workshop that Simon did, and also just going through his code, running it, see if it works, take bits of chunks out and just, just seeing how you get through that bit. Um, and the next bit I want to do, if I'm on the right page, just to finish off, if I can find my sheets, is ongoing learning. <coughs> so I've really thrown a lot at you today. So there was about creating charts, data manipulation, and also now our markdown. And you, you've seen sort of like snippets of what you can do with geospatial and maps, which I haven't covered, the statistics, there's a lot. So no doubt you'll want to kind of follow this up with your own working environment, what you've, your own interests are. So for ongoing learning, these are some recommendations. It says in this um, slide, and I do agree with this, but I do recognize how difficult it can be. When you're learning R, it's good to practice it and to have problems, real problems that you can solve with it. And it can be very difficult when you have alternatives that are so much faster because you're familiar with them. It took me a long time to drop SQL, for example, because SQL did everything I, I could do with R until I learned a bit more R and then could work away from it. But if you need something doing quickly, you tend to want to do that in the fastest possible way with the solutions that you've already got to hand. So it takes time, but it is worthwhile doing. Uh, I, I just love it. That's, that's my sales pitch. I just love it. But there are alternatives. There are other things. It's not the only thing that's out there, and particularly for data science. There's other um, technical languages out there, programming languages, which are equally as good. It's just what you find that suits you. And I think the thing for me is that it's the community that keeps me going with this. There's a lot of people really, really keen to help and teach other people. So regular immersion is the best way but I did stop and start that's that's another way whenever I could do training courses I did a couple of workshops in di <coughs> different areas one more statistical one more this I did the NHSR one you'll be rewarded eventually um, if not straight away so just keep at it I'd say quick fixes though you always want quick fixes stack overflow was mentioned before it usually comes up quite often when you put in a question. But unlike SQL, for example, where you've really got one standard industry best way of answering some things, R is very, very flexible. There's history to it. There are different opinions on it. There are different packages. So there are more than one ways of writing styles as well. And you might not always like the answers or even understand them. I've used code, but I had no idea how it worked and it clashed with some other things I used. So the, the strategy for Stack Overflow is very, very key, I think. If you're looking for something like you have learned today, I would ask the question and put dplyr at the end of that Google search if you're using Google. To then direct the responses to dplyr because there'll be other things as well. But I'm going to also go to this particular question that was asked nine years ago. It's a very popular question. Nine years and 11 months, it's ticking up. It's gonna be 10, month, 10 years soon. This has a lot of responses to it um, about grouping multiple columns and summing other multiple columns. So don't worry too much about the question. I'm just going to whiz through and explain why I would avoid some of the answers because I don't understand them. So the first one gets 21 responses, 21 upticks. It's been voted really highly and it's a very good answer, but it's about the package that I don't know very much about, which is data table. There are some people in NHSR Slack who do. Um, so I wouldn't really know how to combine that into my dplyr code. I would be specifically looking in this regard for a dplyr answer. People do write, which is quite nice. This is how you could do this in dbase R. This is how you can do it in um, dplyr. This is also data. And sometimes they do that within the same answer, which is really fancy and very helpful. Base R gets a lot of votes, but 
And the next one is Plyr, and that was an older package version of Dplyr. And this particular one underneath, Dplyr, is although it's still current, some of the functions in it are not so current because I don't recognize these. But as I scroll down, Plyr is an old version. Um, I think this one is, this is what I would use next. Five votes, which is very, very little. But I know that this is a new verb across. So very new. This answer came in in 2020. <coughs> so unlike uh, probably looking for hotels or something like this, you'd look at TripAdvisor and see who gets the most votes. In Stack Overflow, sometimes the one right at the bottom is the most recent and it might not get so many votes, but it's still really good. So that's really tricky to sort of navigate. And I really took, a, it took me a long time to know which one would be better, but some people are very clear about, it doesn't say it in this one, where they may say, oh yeah, these have now superseded and we now use this verb. That can be very helpful. So that's, that's like a really quick how to use Stack Overflow, particularly for R. The advice for other programs would be slightly different, I'm sure. Longer term fixes will be like the book club. Um, somebody did actually ask um, when it is. It's on the 12th of November, I think. So a week on Friday. I think we're doing it from two till three, which is our normal book club period. And it's going to be chapters two to three point one. That's going to be really good if I got that right off the top of my head. Details are on our NHSR Slack group. I would really recommend you go on there, even if you don't want to use Slack very much, just to keep in touch with the book club, because that's where we put things. But also on the NHSR GitHub. Oh, I got that. Oh, I've probably got a shortcut, actually. I think we have a book club here. Book club group. And I can share that with you. So I did put some information on there as well. <clears throat> oh, it's taking a while to load. So R for data science. Uh, two to three. I got quite a lot of that right, it says. Oh, sorry, I've got a message from Jim and you asked for the URL to this page and I've just moved on and I'm not sure which page it was. Was it the um, book club or was it? Oh, that was the book club you wanted. Excellent. And I've lost where my page. There we are. So we are going to be reading the book on the left, well, at least the first few chapters. And maybe when we get through that, we might read the book on the right, which is ggplot2. They're both freely available online, which makes them really good for um, book club, but they're also very clear and concise. And this is what this course is based on. <clears throat> they're both written by Hadley Wickham as well, <laughs> which is great. There are some other things as well, like this big book of R is actually a book that's been created with lots of uh, links to because there are so many things oscar has collected this uh, all together as much as you can and you can contribute to this because it's hosted on github data visualization which is what we've covered today look there's all sorts of ooh, bbc visual data journalism is in there as well so there's lots and lots of resources in there the recordings somebody's asked for as well so that's a good point too let me get those up so it's nhsr youtube I think if I just type that, that's where I get quite a lot of stuff. So if I just share that with everybody, <clears throat> that's going to be ironic for people watching this on YouTube, seeing YouTube mentioned like some sort of fractal thing. Oops, I've just gone back to, sorry. <clears throat> if people like blogs uh, and enjoy blogs, there are lots of blog compendiums in a sense. So they do these things like our weekly and our bloggers. There is the NHSR community blog where you can contribute too. I started off doing this myself and really my blogs were long and they were detailed and I didn't know how to blog. I wrote some which were just text like this one, just words. And I wrote some technical ones. And it's just a, a nice friendly way of just making sure that, not making sure, just contributing to my future self because I've used them occasionally or to other people and just if you're doing something particularly in your area it's the chances are there's somebody else who will find that interesting or could use some of the techniques you use for their area so I definitely recommend that and then you don't have to get involved with setting up your own blog space and people do check it as well to make sure that it's 
um, from, in my case, coherent, uh, so that I'm, I'm making sense or I'm using the right code. And that can be quite good, but uh, that's, yeah, it's a really nice way of just getting into it, maybe and starting if you're a budding writer or you found something that you think would be really good to share with the community, definitely consider contributing through the blogs. There's also Twitter for hashtag RStats. Lots of people ask questions on there and random strangers will help you. Sometimes our studio people will come and help you as well. So that's a really great way of capturing an audience. The Slack group, which I've mentioned a number of times now, you'll be so bored of that, but also uh, the government data science channel, which is <clears throat> only for certain email addresses. It's much stricter, but it gives you, it's very, very active. It's uh, accessed, accessed by what was Public Health England. Um, I can't remember the name of their new organization. UK, uh, yeah, the Public Health England as it was, this is, uh, they're gonna just stay like that. ONS, some civil servants, NHS, local authorities. I think if you're NHS, the best email to get into the account directly is through nhs.net rather than your own individual organizational email address. Oh, that's loading, right. Uh, just a couple of extra bits that are really useful. There are lots of people who work as lecturers or they work in the university. That's it, somebody's thankfully. <laughs> Health Security Agency. It's going to be like the Opal Fruits Starburst thing for me. That's always going to be Opal Fruits. Um, people are very, very happy, it seems, to share their code and their methodology and their presentations. So there's lots of great university lecturers out there who have, like I, I showed you Danielle's artist, artistry work before, but she's also produced these uh, slides which have been based on Jenny Bryan's slides about how to name your files. Now it seems really basic, but it does seem like something that people who have, this is what they're saying for the younger generations, growing up with iPads or tablets or mobile phones, you don't save files in a particular place or in a folder structure. So when the new generation is coming into the universities and they say, save your file there, here, there and everywhere, they don't know how to do it. They've never needed to do that necessarily. So this is maybe a basic uh, presentation slide, but it's really, really useful to try and get an idea of how to do things correctly and how to avoid bad practice. Danielle's based her presentation slides on Jenny's, which are also available out there. And this, this is really nice that people reuse the data and the, the methodology in the slides, and then they give each other credit for it. So that's really good to look at. And also their YouTube videos too. <clears throat> there, are also, <clears throat> there are other lecturers who do things like, uh, there's a really good site about data science in a box from mine, who I uh, think works for our studio and some other um, universities and so that could be very good too I don't think there's a link for that but data science I'm sure I've looked at this a few times in a box that's a ni ooh, nice mixture of videos and code and I highly recommend having a look at that one too there's just some amazing resources out there and I can't find my slides there we go and that's the end there is so much out there, it's hard to always keep on top of everything. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm not quite at half past four. So if there are any other questions, I can ask that I can answer that as best I can. Thank you for being a great audience. And hopefully uh, I'll stop the recording. <laughs>